call this meeting to order. Um, and would you like to do roll call, please? Absolutely. Director Ferris? Here. Director Swan? Here. Director Falls? Here. President Henry? Here. Director Moran? Here. Okay. Uh, so, any public comment? At this moment, I guess that would be me if it's yeah. appropriate right now. So, well, I have pleasure. anybody out there can talk, whether it's you or you know, okay. What are you guys sitting next to? <laughs> so, yeah. I'm going to stand up just because I have some stuff here. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting with Rick and Gina today, and I felt like it was pretty productive. We got a pretty good understanding. I just wanted to make a couple points since I'm the one making the points for my side, and I'm sure they're going to make the points for your side. So, uh, yeah, from what I understood from Rick's email, and if you would let me go a little bit longer than five minutes, if there's some back and forth we want to do, I would hope that you'd consider that. Uh, I realize that's a little extra that I'm not entitled to. So basically, uh, yeah, I uh, got Rick's email, and he said that the thing that you were most concerned with was uh, justification for that kind of thing for my property. Now, uh, I mentioned to him a couple things, I'm sure we'll bring those up in general too. I looked at the bid from, what, two or three years ago? That was a couple years back. Prices have definitely gone up. And 740000 is the earth uh, related cost, about 740, dollars 750. Nowadays, it's going to be at least 800000 So I am looking to save the district a ton of money. But, and excuse me for the theatrics, but if I said, here's eight bucks, and all you have to do is pay me $1 back for giving it to you, that's not a bribe. That's a service fee. That, that's what I would be deserving of giving you $8. That would be an excellent offer for anybody. Here's $8. You can just keep it. Just give me one back. I can save you guys $800,000 at my asking price. Now, that alone is an excellent justification. I really believe so. Anytime anybody wants to save me $800,000 for $100,000, I'm open to it. The other justification is that this is not comparing apples to apples. If you look at my property, and Rick's been there, Gina saw it today, and Rick had seen it a long time ago when I was talking about trees only. But basically, these don't have three-way road access. They don't have parking. They have small little trees that aren't worth the value of really large redwoods. And I don't feel that this is appropriate and accurate because of that. It's not comparing my parcel, which is flat, surrounded by three roads, very close to your parcel. The other ones were close. But as far as the value to me of my parcel, it's worth more than just you know, a little bit of money, that's why I keep it. And if I want to sell it, I will sell it for my price. And I think that you as a house owner or anybody who owns any property here, if somebody came up to you and said, I'll give you 100000 for your house, and you said, no, I want 600000 for it, well, if they didn't want to pay that 600000 then you don't have to sell it to them. I'm doing the district a good deed, which I expect to be rewarded for. I don't think that's unfair to ask. And that's my position on that. As far as the price, I did come down today, and I am willing to negotiate. I'm not being really rigid, but I do think I deserve, every time I sold real estate in the past, I was sorry for it. I sold a house on the west side for 150000 I sold an apartment in Europe for $75,000. they are all worth double now. And they can print money, but they can't print land, and that's flat land with beautiful access for you guys. And that's all I'm saying is I'm offering it to the district. And I don't want to be cornered into, now that you've offered it, you're going to be punished if you don't follow through. I am following through. I'm just asking for what I feel is reasonable. And the third part of why I feel it's reasonable is Steve Gettle, who's an MAI realtor, uh, Vista Properties, is a senior appraiser, director, a real estate advisor, broker of Gettle and Associates, 92 till the present. That's over, what, that's about 20 years. This guy has an excellent record. He's a specialist, and he can, he can do the appraisal. He said it's going to be hard. He's going to charge a lot for it, and I'd rather save the district that money. What I'm asking, I believe, is below what he would come up, and he also agreed, and my real estate uh, attorney also agreed, that the redwoods on there do have value. I mean, a wooded lot is worth much more than a non-wooded lot. A lot with a large grove of redwoods is clearly, and it's flat with parking, is clearly more <coughs> than a little valley parcel with some scrawny trees on it. So those are my things. <coughs> I mean, if you want it for the price of an unbuildable parcel, I would expect that you would make a promise never to build on it. It is zoned for residential one, and that means that it also is zoned for public structures, 
So this would be a public structure. There's another word that they use in there, public structures and something else down here. But it, it's already zoned for that, so it can be appraised for that. It can be appraised for its highest and best use value, which my real estate attorney has advised me, uh, is normal in many of these cases. And I realize that anytime anybody threatens to go to court, somebody's getting bad legal advice. <clears throat> Both parties can't win, right? So, I mean, whether it's Vieira or anybody, or that woman Christine, the district has spent a lot of money on legal cases. You guys have two tanks down the road that are deteriorating rapidly. One of them is tilting towards the road. There's a house right down the other side. I would hope, and I've been, I've been asking for this before I even mentioned my property, that you would do the replacement so that you're not liable for any catastrophe that might happen there. I'm offering this. There's going to be more congestion on my road. The parking, as Rick saw today when he parked, it's hard to get a car to park in there, and I'm sure you could increase the parking area a little bit, but there's going to be issues if I sell it to you. There's the negative issues. I mean, what if there's ever an earthquake and it doesn't meet the standard of a 9.0 earthquake, and we get flooded out after surviving an earthquake? I mean, there's a lot of issues. I'd like to have the water tank up there, but you can do, you can do that same size tank on your other property. You had it listed for 29 feet wide. On my property, the tank would be 30 feet wide. That is that much difference on either side of the tank on your old site. Now, you don't want to because it's going to be expensive, and I understand that. And that's why I'm offering it, my property. And deal with the hassle of having it across the street. And water trucks coming in and out every once in a while, and all the building and the destruction to the, the naturalness of it. Rick has agreed that uh, you know you can keep that down a little bit, but as far as the road, that's a private road. There's going to be more traffic going up there. It's a one-lane road with two-way traffic, and it's getting worse all the time. And I don't really want to see you guys that much closer to my property, to tell you the truth. It would be nicer to have it further down the street at the old site. So I believe that the old site is doable, and that negates any possibility of I mean, the main although you could try for that, it would take you over a year. I can do the minimum so that I don't lose by default, which I don't want to do. We can do the $5,000 appraisal from Steve Gettle, and it'll probably come out over more than what I'm asking. If it doesn't, then I don't have a right to that. But it adds $5,000 onto the price. And so I'd rather just, I, I ask myself, what's the minimum I could be satisfied with for letting go of that property? And that's it. And I came down a little bit more today. I'm willing to work with you guys. I love the water district, making the district better. That's you know, that's obvious from my, my history, but I don't expect any favors. I just want to be treated in a way that if I don't want to sell it, I don't have to sell it. That's what sales are about. You've got to either meet my price or you go somewhere else. I mean, that's what a sale is, right? You can't just walk in and say, I'll give you this price and you have to take it. Now, I, I don't mind helping the water district. I'm glad to do it. But anyway, that's pretty much it. Uh, I think we can find common ground. I mean, this could be a win-win-win situation for everybody. The rate payers, you guys have saved $600,000. How's that not good for the rate payers? I don't see any, any way that it isn't good. And the same with having a new site, you get new land. I'm losing some of my land. I don't have many assets left. And that's why I want to get my best price. And I think what is called the highest and best use valuation is applicable. And actually, I've been told that by several sources. So I have an appraiser who's willing to do that. I'd rather not go that route and just settle with you guys Get it sold to you fast. We get a new tank up there. It's good for Rick in his last years. It's good for the water district. It's good for, I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, you know, why not close up on a high note? You got a couple more years and you're going to retire. So anyway, yeah, I mean, I'm up for it. It's just that it is an inconvenience to have it that far up the street that close to me. And it's going to affect our private road. And there's some impact on the wildlife. I like having that parcel to be able to go on it. I would want it to be kept open at all times, except for the area right around the tank, for wildlife and stuff like that. But I care about the neighborhood, I care about the nature, and I care about my family. And I care about the water district. That's why I offered it in the first place. So that's about it. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Okay. Anybody else in the audience want to say? Then we will go to closer. <laughs> Meeting to order, and I'm so happy to see so many of you here tonight. Um, this, we, there's nothing uh, to announce from out of closed session tonight. <clears throat> So, um, you want to call, do you roll call, please? Yeah. Director Ferris? Here. Director Swan? Here. Director Fulce? Here. President Henry? Here. Director Moran? Here.
Thank you. All right. The first part of this meeting will be for public comment. And since we have so many people here, I'm going to eliminate the five-minute rule. It's going to be three minutes. Uh, and I'm usually pretty good about saying finish your statement. But tonight I'm going to ask you, if you aren't done, finish in a sentence. Um, and, and then you are done. Also, sometimes I've let somebody speak again on the same subject. Uh, normally we don't ever do that. It's just uh, one time on each item. So I'm going to be a little... Uh, uh, what do I want to say? Hard nose tonight, maybe. Uh, I, I'm just, I'm, we just have a lot of business tonight, unfortunately. So, would anyone in the audience like to make a comment now about anything that's not on the agenda? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Jim Mosier from Felton. Uh, I just wanted to speak briefly about my role as a member of the Flow organization. There's been some stuff in the press about uh, me being having a special interest group. And I just want to say the extent to which Flow is a special interest group, I'm very proud of it. Our special interest is the health of this water district in the valley. We've worked very hard for this. We're all spending approximately 40 bucks a month to be a member of this, so we are very passionate about it. We care about this. We want to work with you all uh, to maintain strong board and protect our environment. And to the extent that we are concerned about the environmental protection issues and the watershed protection, we are going to voice our concerns. We strongly support the infrastructure improvements. Um, in fact, we, uh, many of us, most of us supported the rate increases that were imposed by the previous board, which are critical to the infrastructure improvements that you all are doing. We want to see that happening, um, and we want to work with you all to make sure that this... I also just want to say that I really appreciate the hard work the five of you are doing. I recognize, looking at this agenda today, how much work you're doing, and we know you're not getting paid to do it. So we want to be as as supportive as we can to making this a strong district. Um, and the extent we have disagreements, let's figure out ways to work them out. Okay. Anyone else wish to comment on anything that's not on the agenda? All quiet on the western front there. So uh, we're going to go to unfinished business at this time. And the first item has to do, um, well, I'll let Rick, you tell me what the first item is. Well, uh, the, the first item is a discussion and possible action regarding approval of the final initial <coughs> mitigated, the final initial study the mitigated negative declaration for the Lumpico water tanks replacement project. As part of the Lumpico San Lorenzo Valley Water District consolidation, the district is moving forward with replacing several water tanks. Uh, in Lampico. The project uh, is the replacement of the Caskey, Madrone, and Lewis tank sites located in Lampico. The attached documents in your packet, uh, together with the draft initial study mitigated uh, negative uh, declaration, draft IS uh, MND, constitutes the final initial study for the mitigated negative declaration for the Lampico water tank replacement project. The San Lorenzo Valley Water District is the lead agency for the project. The final uh, IS and MMB consists of introduction, comment letters uh, received during the 30-day public review period, responses to comments, and revisions to the draft. Uh, if deemed applicable, the draft uh, was prepared to inform the public of the potential environmental uh, effects of the project, identify possible ways to minimize potential project-related uh, impacts. Uh, pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act uh, secret guidelines, the draft uh, was circulated for a 30-day uh, review period during which comments could be submitted. 
October 25th, 2019. Uh, the uh, draft was distributed to public review, uh, period, in response to uh, the trustee agencies, interested groups, and individuals. The review period ended on November 25th, 2019. Uh, tonight at this meeting, you're to consider adoption of the final uh, ISMND and approval of the proposed project. Tonight we have both the design firm uh, here and we have the uh, environmental consultants here. Uh, we have uh, Matt Johnson, uh, not to be confused with Matt Johnson. Yes. Who's also in the lodge here tonight. <laughs> and we have uh, Andy Steinberg. Or Sturbridge. Pardon? Um, I hear from the consulting engineer first. Okay. Uh, both, and I'm not sure if you want to do a presentation or you want to speak or you just want to answer questions. I don't have anything planned. I'm just here in case you guys have any questions. Okay. okay. And just here to answer questions. Okay, just to answer questions. So, um, questions from the board? Any questions? Sure. No. No comments, right? We didn't no. receive comments. Um, so we did receive public, some comments. Yeah, we public. Did. We received comments from uh, the County of Santa Cruz, um, uh, environmental planner from the County of Santa Cruz, Matt Johnson from the, <laughs> from the County of Santa Cruz, um, from uh, uh, citizen Deborah Lowen, and from, actually that was it, nothing from any, any other state uh, responsible agencies. Could you summarize the comments? Yes. Um, Mr. Johnston's comments regarded uh, entirely on biology. Um, there were several comments about um, species and how they were uh, included or not included in the environmental analysis. And he suggested additional mitigation to some of the species that we had included, uh, which the district has decided to adopt. Um, and then the comments from uh, Ms. Lowen uh, were more about uh, the infrastructure and how it was described in the document. Um, apparently the Lewis tank site uh, had another tank that wasn't being considered as part of this project because it was dismantled before this project was put into uh, design phase. So wasn't evaluated as part of the CEQA and so she was more uh, concerned with putting that information out there in terms of making sure that the system was uh, described correctly, so we responded to that. Um, she also had some concerns about the uh, hydrology of the, of the system because um, runoff, she was concerned that runoff would not infiltrate into, and we responded to that comment with the, uh, the development of the swales that are going to be there and how the, the system will be using the sheet flow. Most of it will, most of the runoff will just leave the site from sheet flow and whatever it isn't is going to be going to the drainage basins that are going to be installed. Yeah, we used to have Lewis 1 and Lewis 2 up yes. there. Yes. And one of them leaked so bad, hardly ever had any water in The others are starting to leak that way too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and how about the uh, people in the audience there uh, are Customers, our rate payers, if you got questions about this negative declaration at all? Yes. Oh, Debbie. <laughs> I couldn't tell whose call was it. Sorry. Yes. Deborah Lowen, I am the person that submitted the <laughs> questions. Um, just two things really quickly. We went over an engineering committee today. I am like all over this district about getting it right <laughs> about how what the existing system is at Lompico. And I'm hearing that it's not really important for this environmental report for the impact, but it is very important for the citizens of Lompico. And it, the reason is because we are paying a special assessment. We are paying an assessment to replace six tanks. And quite frequently it's described as replacing five tanks. That's very annoying to me. I have to answer to people for that, so that's the reason that I wanted that a little bit more known. My second comment is I am so glad this is being done. This was supposed to have started in 2016. 
um, that was the plan, to start immediately doing this. And thank you for pointing out that the tanks are, they're all leaking now. They were starting to leak really badly. The, as Lois said, one tank we had to remove. The state said it leaked too much. We had to remove it. We, the, the reason we joined SLV is we needed these things being done immediately. So <clears throat> thank you, Board. Thank you, Rick. Um, thank you for proceeding with it. And our construction guy back there, or the Design. tank? What, what are you? <laughs> What is he? Uh, the design engineer. Oh, the design engineer. Sorry. Got it. No comments for me. You know, I'm just here, again, I'm just here to answer questions. Okay. All right. Now, anybody else in the audience there have a comment on this? So. We have a resolution uh, number 14 that, that for the board to adopt. Yes. I'll make a motion that we adopt resolution number 14, 19-20. Uh, and I'll second it. And uh, can I have a time to say something about this motion? Oh, I thought that I'd ask the board to talk. Okay. But you no, know, you go ahead. Okay. So um, in reviewing this uh, project, I was impressed about the extent to which um, the review goes into environmental uh, questions, and I was really pleased with it. Um, there's going to be a qualified biologist on site when uh, questions that uh, that person needs to answer will be there. Um, there's uh, worker environmental awareness training. Um, there's even a disturbance coordinator. This is going to be going on from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. There's some noise problems. There's someone in the work crew that's designated to handle uh, neighborhood issues with noise. And so I'm glad that all those things are in this plan. Uh, and the other thing is $94,000 of this plan goes to a mitigation bank so that when we disturb the Mount German June beetle on the, I believe, the lowest, Lewis tank, uh, that this $94,000 is going to be set aside in a non-wasting fund that we have to ensure that sandhill habitat of equal size or more is protected. And so there's a lot of environmental um, safeguards that are in this project, and I'm glad to see that. So any of you who haven't read this document, it's really interesting. It is. And there's all kinds of things, not just the June beetle, but the kangaroo rat and the wood rat and birds and I don't think there's any frogs, my favorite, but uh, no frogs. No frogs. <laughs> I know frogs. <laughs> so it's really interesting. Just just be sure to read it. it it's all full of all kinds of good information. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. So Director Ferris. Aye. Director Swan. Yes. Director Falls. Yes. President Henry. Yes. And Director Moran. Yes. Motion passes. Bravo. Okay. So <laughs> you want to introduce the next item? Yes, um, uh, item 10B, the strategic plan update. Uh, we've been working on this on September 15, 2019. Director Fultz submitted a, uh, a draft strategic plan for consideration. Uh, the plan intended to provide a draft for board discussion and consideration. After discussion, the board requested that the strategic plan be sent to the administrative committee to discuss and recommend a process for moving forward. Then on, on October 2nd, 2019, the Administration Committee met and discussed moving forward in development process points for board consideration, which you should have a, that full memo attached uh, in your agenda. October 17th, the board uh, directed uh, the board director's meeting, the board director staff to move forward and select a facilitator for uh, assisting with updating the strategic plan. And then on October or November 13th, 2019, the board held a special meeting to hear a proposal from Greg Larson of the Management Partners, a professional management consulting firm uh, specializing in helping local government leaders <coughs> improve their operations. 
Uh, the intent of the meeting was to discuss uh, the process of moving forward with the strategic plan, and propose uh, alternatives and cost estimates moving forward with updating the district strategic plan. Uh, attached in your packet uh, for board discussion and consideration is the proposal from management partners to facilitate a strategic plan process. The plan includes review, background material, uh, conduct interviews, meeting and prepare a board workshop, um, coordinate logistics and prepare a strategic plan. As part of the proposal, there are uh, optional activity services available for the board's review, such as facilitating a community forum and online survey. Uh, looking for moving forward with direction from the board. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Uh, any comments from the board here on this item? Yes. Yes. I, um, I want to be clear. I believe Bob Fultz drafted this strategic plan out of a good faith desire to create an in house document saving ratepayers the high cost of a consultant. I know Bob, and I know it was not his intention to bypass any public input. Rather, it could serve as a starting point. <clears throat> in this plan, he expressed ideas and priorities as he had during the election, in which the public at large overwhelmingly agreed. I appreciate all the work you did on this, Bob. Thank you. This board has already made so much progress for our water district, ratepayers, and the environment. For me, at this time, the strategic plan takes our focus away from other important projects we are currently working, working on. We have an infrastructure that needs constant attention, the administration building needs answers, and fire management is paramount on people's minds. The 2018 grand jury recommended that directors, staff, and committee members receive training for addressing contentious issues. Before we tackle a strategic plan, I think all parties would benefit by a form of conflict resolution training. What we do is important, but so is how we do it. I would like the board to form an ad hoc committee to seek out a facilitator to carry out this organizational training, and it should be on the next agenda. Previous boards have expressed a commitment to training, but never followed through. We should not make the same mistake. We need to get training done and then come back to the strategic plan at a later date. Greg Larson has made a proposal that could certainly help us in creating an updated strategic plan. And we could seek his help when we are truly ready. Then we could come back and have a much more productive process. Thank you. I, um, I would like to be sure that we do the strategic plan the right way that it includes the public, all board members, staff, and if we did nothing else, one of the things that uh, was proposed was email outreach to the public. What was, what was the cost on that, $3,500, I think? Like that. that even if we just did that uh, to start off, I, I, I agree with what you were saying about conflict resolution, but I think it would be great if we could put that out there, at, at least have him do public outreach for us by email. I, I believe that was like... Him who? Who? Well, him who? Well, Greg was, he said Greg, something in here about the optional yeah. online community survey. Yeah. That was a survey. Yeah, yeah. would yeah, require 60 survey. hours for $2,100. Oh, is it $2,100? $2,100. I, I think there's there's a lot of merit uh, to consider here, but, you know, Rick, I like what you're saying because actually we need to do that grant to fulfill our grand jury obligations. And um, even though that grand jury report was done, uh, at a different time than when we were on the board, it's it's not directed at individuals, it's directed at the board. And so I think doing that first before we consider these things makes a lot of sense. And I, I would agree with that. Doing what first? The, the, training, uh, the training. training on how to handle contentious issues. Yeah, okay. Because clearly this is, has the potential for that. 
Yeah, I, I based mean, on letters and emails and to, stuff, I think you're right. To, um, and to basically combine an obligation you have under the grand jury report with this process, I think makes a lot of sense. And I'm, I'm glad you came up with the idea. Okay. The online um, survey would be 2100. Yeah. The 3800 was community form, yeah, for form. In, in addition to this whole, the cost. This whole proposal was 21 grand. Yeah. Right, yeah. pretty much. But, but I yeah. think I think doing the training first and then coming back to this, regardless of what it is that we decide to do, makes sense. Okay. What's that cost? Do you know? Well, that would be conflict resolution for just the board or the board, the staff, and the public. Or well, the, the grand jury recommendation board is the board, <coughs> senior staff, and committee members. That's what the grand jury, the 2018 grand jury recommendation is. And it would be open to the it would be a public meeting, so it would be open. <clears throat> all the contentious people can show up. <laughs> well, everybody can show up. Yeah. yeah. Anybody who wants to learn how to be non contentious. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what would we, what would we have? To, I mean, we'd have to form a committee then as a board, right? And have, you're saying have our committee. You had in mind one or two people. Um, I would like to include Rick Rogers on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I know this is an issue that I've brought up a number of times and um, feel like connected to and I'd like to be part of. Um, and if there needs to be another member, uh, I'd certainly uh, welcome that. But I have uh, some, uh, I've made some inquiries of who's available to do this kind of work and um, I have some ideas. So I don't like ad hoc committees okay. that are secret because many times ad hoc committees meet privately. They don't announce their meetings. I don't like that. Okay. Let me just interject here that talking about the composition of an ad hoc committee per the, the board member's recommendation gets a little off the topic here today. That would need to be a separate agenda item in another meeting. And that's why I suggested that we could bring yeah. this back, the next, this whole subject matter back to the next meeting. Yeah, I think the concept, you know, talking about the concept yeah. works. And it doesn't have, I, it, any way you want. I, my point is to get to uh, hiring a consultant that can do the training for uh, contentious issues. That's my point. How it's done, I don't care, ad hoc committee to the whole committee, to whatever we need to do. That's my purpose. Or an ad hoc committee that meets the public. I mean, you could do that too. Sure enough. I, I agree with your point, Ross. Transparency is uh, utmost. Of or is this something that could be worked out at full board level at a special meeting or two? Right. To get to could, the. Could be. I think it's a benefit to have a full board yeah. present and move maybe in a special meeting or two. We could discuss that at the next. To get it worked uh, out. We could bring this back on the agenda with a couple. I can work with Gina on a couple suggestions. Okay. That sounds good. So um, let's go out to our ratepayers here. Uh, wait a minute. Are, yeah, we, are, we, are we still on strategic planning? Yes. Yeah, it's still yeah. strategic planning. Yeah. I, May I make a comment? Yes. Actually, a few comments. <clears throat> First of all, I would like everybody to know that I did read all 12 <coughs> of those emails and or letters <coughs> that were sent in to the board of directors, and I appreciate the feedback. Uh, I would also like to share that I took those, those letters and emails that created a criteria chart out of it because it was a little too much to process, you know, one at a time and trying to relate that to, to, to the whole. I, what I did then was I created with the, uh, the public member on the <laughs> y-axis, I created a reason code on the x-axis and tried to extract from each of the emails and letters the, the salient points. And I came up with some interesting, at least I found interesting, uh, information that the most common comment was that we should be using Greg Larson as a facilitator. Mm -hmm. That came up seven times. Um, why we're changing the existing strategic plan came up six times. More public involvement came up five times. Uh, and just, just as a, a calibration point, what I thought was going to be at or toward the top was the changing of the mission statement. That was tied at third with, with three. So, to me, this was a really important exercise to do because I think I have captured, at least in my mind, what I think the salient points 
from the public comments are. And what I plan on doing with this is once we identify a facilitator, hopefully Greg Larson, I will share this information with him. So if, if you, okay, number one, thank you. Number two, I heard you. And number three, I plan on doing something with this information. Steve, did you have anything? All right, I'll, I'll let you folks that came tonight have your say. Okay, and anybody out there want to say anything about this discussion? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Elaine. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> I wasn't sure you were pointing out. Uh, I'm Elaine from the Felton, and uh, I just want to say that I really appreciate your suggestion, Director Moran. I think it's I think it's very good, and I think that we all could benefit from a conflict resolution training. And I also want to say that I love what you did. Director Ferris, I mean, you. I feel like we've been heard, and I think that that is just really important. And um, thank you. Anybody else? Larry. <clears throat> thank you, Larry Ford from Felton. Uh, I uh, I want to also thank all of you for all your hard work on this. I've been meeting with several of you. Um, uh, for informal meetings, and it's been really productive, and I've learned a lot. Um, what I want to suggest is that what um, Director Ferris just described were the uh, commonalities between some of the comments. I think there were some other very specific suggestions made that I think you should also review. And among those, um, I think it's it's very clear that the best practices should be followed, and that would be the full proposal, if not even more, than what Greg Larson proposed. Um, anything short of that, I think, would be leaving you open to not only more contention, but uh, a lot of criticism and delay in, in making any progress. Um, I think one of the key points is that uh, the public doesn't want to just be heard. We want to participate. So that means not just having a hearing, or, uh, you know, listening, um, but actually to participate. And that's going to be one of the lessons that you'll learn in, in uh, conflict resolution or conflict mediation training, is that you can't just m march ahead without um, coming along with community participation. And so um, I also want to identify a couple of alternatives that I proposed in my letter. Um, one of them was that Maybe it's not so important to provide a new strategic plan. Maybe the important thing really is to make it more concise and usable by staff. What I heard from staff was not that they needed a new strategic plan. They needed more clarity on what <clears throat> it is that they're supposed to do because there are such different proposals out there. So um, I think that could be done in a couple of different ways. One of them would be to... Um, get somebody like Greg Larson or your own uh, director Ferris, who's an international expert on strategic planning, um, to distill down the current plan to its main points and uh, present to the board any issues that need to be clarified, like what are the priorities. Um, I, I uh, completely support all the priorities that have come up. You know, we need to save money, we need to be more fiscally responsible, we need to get going, if not expedite the uh, infrastructure. We also need uh, a new headquarters for the staff and operations, and we need urgently to make progress on the fire management planning. We, we're having a brief reprieve, but as soon as the drought starts, which could be as early as February, we're going to be, you know, possibly back in fire season. Anyway, um, those are my points. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Yes, sir. Mark Shargell from Felton. Um, I spent a bunch of time looking at documents uh, relating to the redraft of the mission statement strategic plan. I hadn't been to one of these board meetings until this issue came up, so I decided it mattered. Uh, I think it's a big deal. 
Um, that said, my time has been nothing compared to the time that you've all put in, so I will echo the thanks that you get and richly deserve from the public for what you do. Um, speaking of thanks, um, Director Ferris demonstrated, I thought, a terrific example um, of proving that he was paying attention and listening. Um, that little quick bit of data gathering and, and summarization, terrific. It's an example of the sort of inclusive and deliberative process that I believe you need to undertake to do some long range planning. In my study of these documents, my position on what you should do has changed. I've learned about it and thought about it and changed my mind a bit. Um, I think you do need to undertake some long range planning on issues that you don't have a clear path in front of you. Among those are the uh, um, infrastructure maintenance catch up and forward going um, upgrade incremental replacement so that we don't get into a position where <clears throat> I found myself over Thanksgiving weekend while thousands of miles away and the water main on Orchard Road where I live failed and my teenage house sitter called and said, uh, the water's not on, did I do something wrong? <laughs> it's okay, they're fixing it, I know these people, they're gonna get, they get the job done. And, they, and of course, within a few hours, they did. Um, and I know the steel plates will come up soon, thank you. Oh, um, that was you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was me. Um, I read the mission statement redraft carefully. I think it's got issues and problems that may get you into problems. Um, there's enough internal conflict within the potentially opposing values stated there that if you spend money on something that isn't literally delivery of water to my tap, somebody could object, maybe even legally. On the other hand, if you do spend money on something that isn't directly related to giving water to my tap, somebody could object, again, with legal action. We've had enough of that. It's a misdirection of this board's effort and my funds. Let's stay out of that. So the conclusion I've come to is that I can't improve a single word in the existing mission statement. Long-range planning does have to happen. If that happens through a strategic plan, it should be as inclusive, deliberative as you can make it, with a whole lot of public involvement, not just meeting, um, but listening. One more sentence. Okay. Um, I'm concerned about some of the rhetoric that has emerged around the issues we're discussing now. Um, personal attacks are not acceptable. Mm -hmm. If you're pointing at somebody and accusing them of polarizing rhetoric, you're engaging in polarizing rhetoric. We are a community. We were before the last election. We will be after the next election. We're all going to get along one way or another. Let's make it good, please. Thank you, hey, Mark. Uh, Debbie? Yeah, well, thank you. I have a little bit different view in that most of the room is filled with people who aren't there with a special interest, and your special interest is environmental. Very noble cause. If you look online, you'll find a dozen local organizations, that's their main interest. So you have outlets for that. Um, you have education outlets. But this water district needs to do is supply water. So the focus, it's not that somebody's got a bad idea, somebody's got a good idea, it's that we need to focus on the district. I'm a little concerned about the narrative that's been going on. And yes, the, the polarization, absolutely, that's the right word for what's going on. And the singling out of personalities on the board it, it's totally unacceptable. I did a, a weird thing in that the scientists will appreciate it. I did a little empirical, di empirical data gathering. I l went online and I downloaded 10 strategic plans from 10 random places just using a Google strategic plan water district. 60% of those did their strategic plans in-house, board and staff primarily, uh, for use consultants, one used in-house, but they brought in a facilitator, such as this board was suggesting. So the narrative goes, you're not doing it the right way, you're not following the rules. The rules allow you to do it in-house, and a lot of the places are very successful with it. 
Um, I just want to read something really quickly. It was an overview of strategic plans that kind of narrowed it down, and I really liked it. It's simple and clear. To get to the end, where your strategic plan is going, you need to ask the following four key questions. Where are we currently? Where do we want to be in the future? How do we get there? And how do we gauge success and progress? Finally, don't forget, the ultimate we is the taxpayers, because government is accountable for what it spends and the results achieved. It is imperative that the strategic plan be comprehensive, realistic, and financially responsible. And as a taxpayer, who doesn't have any special interest except infrastructure, water supply. I think that it is the fiscal duty of this board to focus on that primarily. If you want to go to ratepayers and say, we believe other programs should be added to it and the rate should be increased to do that, that's for you to go out and find it. But that is not what was included in the rate increase. The proposals were for infrastructure improvements and they are perfectly adequate. I'd also like to say if you would like to do your own empirical research and go look at the minutes from earlier in this year, Bob Fulce was assigned the task to write a draft. He fulfilled his obligation. The manager was assigned the task to find a facilitator, and he is fulfilling his obligation. Thank you. Any, anyone? Yes. Um, yeah. I would actually like the board to reconsider the idea of revising the strategic plan. And the reason for that is, one, I don't think it's necessary, and secondly, I don't think it's a good uh, use of district resources. The reason I don't think it's necessary is, in my experience, strategic plans are generally only rewritten when you're doing it for an outside audience. You're trying to bring in funding, you're trying to commit, get somebody to commit something to you. This is an internal document. Okay? We're not trying to get somebody else to help us. And I've read both the existing one and the proposed one. And to me, uh, there's shading in how things are phrased. But what strikes me is that the existing plan does nothing to prevent the board to do the things that they were elected to do, and which I applaud them doing, of emphasizing infrastructure uh, improvements and fiscal responsibility. I don't think we need to change anything in the strategic plan. It's simply a matter of the board directing staff in the way that they want things done. I also don't think it's a good use of uh, district resources. We're talking, it's not just $21,000 to have somebody come in. Then you have to have a venue and you have to have a staff time that's involved. This is a really costly thing. It's also costly in terms of what we've already seen, in terms <laughs> of the rancor that it's brought up. And I admit I'm an outsider, so I sort of feel like I've flown in and seen um, all of this. And I'm just dismayed um, that this has caused rancor when we should be pulling together. Also, I just came from the engineering committee uh, meeting today, and I, I expected there to be a long list of things to be done, but it truly uh, is is daunting. The Lumpico tank, the land, uh, land slide, um, fish ladders, gigantic pipelines. We have so much we need to be doing, and I just wish that we had the board uh, addressing what I consider those are the really big things that we should be spending our time on. <coughs> Anyone else? Okay. Oh. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Mark Dolson, but I'm about to try to keep this brief because I basically want to echo the, the first three comments. As someone who did write a letter and someone who doesn't really have a, a special environmentalist agenda but is just in, in favor of the board working as well as possible with the community, it was truly gratifying and, and, and impressive to, to see the response of the board members. And I appreciate that. I just wanted you to know that. And I look forward to us all being able to continue working together going forward. Nancy? Yeah, I'm Nancy Macy from Boulder Creek. And it is, it's really interesting that everyone is feeling like there's this horrible conflict. And it was, uh, from my point of view, it was like 
changing boats in the middle of the stream and, and jumping from one that was kind of too big and a little bit cumbersome but really safe for everybody and jumping into a slightly smaller one that was, was a little bit more precarious and we weren't too sure where it was going to go. Um, and so I was leaning toward keep, let's keeping the old one. The, it's, got a, it's got a really good uh, mission statement and the mission statement I do view as separate from the strategic plan. And I, I would like to add my voice that the current mission statement is very beautifully written and it doesn't limit you and it helps you <coughs> assure your community that you want to protect things for the future, that you want to have plenty of water for the future, that you're going to be working hard to um, maintain the infrastructure, that you're going to work hard to maintain the watershed so that it can keep providing water and uh, allow groundwater to be restored and all those wonderful things. Um, and I, I worry that if the focus is only on money, that that, that will actually end up limiting what you're able to do. So um, that said, I was personally accused of not caring about how much everything costs, which is wrong. We're retired, we're on a limited income, we have the same issues of paying our bills, and obviously I'm very concerned about the amount of money that's being spent, and I, I honor that, and I'm grateful that you're doing that. Um, at, at the same time, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's, uh, and, and actually the suggestion to uh, forego uh, until it's time, which was 2020, that's not very far away, um, to do a strategic plan and then there'll be a little bit more thought. That doesn't mean you throw away all of Bob's hard work out, keep those ideas in there, um, but make the strategic plan something that we're all involved in, keep it in house, that's totally fine, you've got incredible expertise. So I think, I think we can all work together and we can make progress as a community and and uh, we'll, we'll work really hard to make sure that um, the community knows what's going on so that they can be here to support you, so they can be here to understand what you want to accomplish. And um, I really love the idea of actually having the uh, um, conflict resolution process done, because uh, that is an eye-opening experience. I've been through it myself. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Does it want to come back to the board now? Any mm -hmm. other comments from the board? Okay. So, so what I'm hearing is we're going to do conflict resolution first. Are we in agreement with that? Yeah. I am. Yeah. yeah. Everybody? Yeah. Sure. Uh, conflict resolution before strategic plan? Yeah. What does that mean to strategic plan? I guess that we won't. Uh, we won't try to, to a, shoot each other or something. To a predetermined, to, a, to, a, to be determined. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think what we're we, suggesting we, is after yeah. we go through this conflict resolution process, that these don't would be. Yeah. yeah. But it doesn't mean we can't have different opinions. Exactly. It's just how we express them, right? Yes. Okay. So is that, am I hearing correctly, summarizing this? I was okay. just asking a question. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're going to move along here. Um, the public advisory. So, uh, I'm sorry. We're not going to discuss the proposal from Greg Larson. No. no. So, uh, item C, please. Yes, uh, August 28, 2019, the Board of Directors agreed to form a public advisory committee of approximately five to seven members um, from the public for the sole purpose of evaluating the district's administration operation facility needs. Staff was directed to solic solicit ap applications from the public to serve on the committee. Applications uh, and announcements were, were posted for the committee on the website, and the announcement was posted on Facebook and the press banner. The closing date to accept applications was October 30th. 
two applications will exceed by the closing date and time. On November 7th, the board extended the closing date to uh, December 2nd uh, for applications and expanded the outreach to uh, the community and solicit more applications. Three additional applications were received for a total of five applicants, which all are included in the packet. Uh, Rick, do we know if the two original applications of people are still uh, ready to, ready to go? And, you know, um, you know, we will, once the board approves, we will reach out and you know, start scheduling and putting together uh, the committee. If, if for some reason anybody backs out and drops below five, does that mean it would have to come back so the committee couldn't form? Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Um, I'd like to talk to council on that. Uh, I don't see a reason why that would be the case. I'd need to go back and look at the uh, motion that formed the ad hoc committee, but um, <coughs> I, I think that uh, it could continue to fight the, 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 the only question is whether there would be a vacant seat on the committee or whether the Maybe I'm not clear on who's in charge of this committee, or are the committee just out of thin air besides what they're doing? Is there well, well, I think, isn't the board able to give direction to the committee at, at what we want it to do? Uh, as a whole board? As a whole board. Okay. Yeah. I would think we'd elect a chair just like the other committees. You know, to be structured just like other committees. But it would be a citizen chair. That's correct. Not a board that's, that's member correct. as a chair. Right. That's correct. But they'd okay. still be open meetings. We talked about yeah. this one before. They'd still open meetings. And would the board, though, be able to provide input into the process in terms of what we want them to, the charge of what we want them to do? I would say yes. Okay. I, I'm just, I would add that that was laid out in the, um, mm -hmm. the memo with the motion to create the ad hoc committee, but there wouldn't be anything to prevent the board from deciding to provide additional. I mean, essentially, there is sort of a charter, if you will, that's been created via the board memo, but the board could supplement that somehow or modify it. I just wanted to be clear on how how this is working. Yeah, and the staff, I believe, would provide structure. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Okay, um, any board members, any other questions Mr. about Collins, this? We wanted, we were offering a five to seven, suggesting five to seven public yeah. members. We yeah. got two people, we, have, we got three more. We have five. So we got five, we don't know if the first two are still interested. It's the first third, fourth of week in, in the first week in December, there's not going to be much going on between now and the end of the month. We probably would be until January. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't we? Well, could we, should we, hold it open and see if we can get some more people to, interested in participating between now and the beginning of January, for example, or the end of this year? I have no problem with that. I guess my one question would be, it would be good if we could start getting, getting going. Do we want to wait until we get one more? Can we go ahead and set meetings and, and start the structure and put together an outline of, of the process? I, I'm just wondering, let's start up for discussion. I mean, it's not a, it's not a bad idea. I, I don't, but I don't know that those are orthogonal. I think you could be working on trying yeah, to get some structure. Yeah, we'd like to start time. moving on the structure, and, and we could we could have it a uh, we could advertise it again. But are there? Any, I mean, is, is there like a charter for this group, or is they created themselves with the staffs? Uh, in, we provided it. That? That's what Gina was addressing. We provided a basic structure. The mm -hmm. question is whether we want to do more. But of course, part of what they're going to do is organize themselves too around that charter we provided. Is there a time frame? I think it's like one year. One year. Mm -hmm. but I don't know. So we've got a year to do the work as a committee. Just to give it another three, four weeks and see if some other people want to participate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I think it's a good idea. Fine with that. 
And we'll notify the other ones up that they've been accepted on the committee. Are we going to appoint them to the committee? So we don't so lose what we have. Yeah, yeah. I, um, a couple of things from the public comment. But, um, yeah. The board, if the board, that presumes that the board does in fact appoint all the folks that have applied so far. So public comment. What if another five people want to be on? Mm -hmm. well, I doubt that's going to happen. So. Wouldn't we do what we've done in the past where we take a look at all ten applicants yeah. and then choose the yeah. seven that we would like or the five? Yeah. That's what I'm wondering, that's the process. Well, I think, yeah. I think the question then is do we approve the five tonight yeah. or wait until the end of the year, come back in January and approve, right? Yeah. So I would okay. suggest waiting. So oh, we can get I, oh, okay. okay. You know, I actually asked the public, yep. and I got a hand up and a pencil. Yes. What is, what is the monthly time commitment for committee members? That's I'd, I'd say approximately two hours. Two so hours we'll a month? meet once a month. There'd be some field trips, we'll, we'll, and, and that. But I'd say on the average, an hour, two hours. A physical meet. Yeah, physical meet. Right. They'll be behind the scenes stuff, but I'm assuming yeah. people would be looking. They'll be homework. Yeah. yeah. Will you allow people to accompany the group when they're doing the film tours? I would have to check with you. It probably is because these were going to be subject to the Brown Act, so I would have to say yes. Because there may be some people who will later on decide they'd like to join. Would that be a possibility, or will you be holding it to a certain number? I think we hold it to the, to the number of the charter. But but that doesn't prevent people from being participant in right. an oral communication. Yeah. You know, it's open to the public. So the, you know, you'll always have an opportunity to participate in it, just whether you sit up here or yeah. you sit there. I'm assuming the rules would be the same, that even though they're conducting meetings, there's time for public comment yeah. on all the business. Exactly. And usually committees are run a little looser, you know. It's the intent that this committee to be conduct as much be very public on all issues due to the past um, due to the past that the project had a lot of interest. And we want to be sure that everybody has a chance who wants to can become involved and can review and, and understand what we're doing and why. I think that's what we we, we had a mistake last time that we did include the public enough. Seems like a great educational opportunity right. for the public. Yeah, you'll tour the basic treatment plants, the office space now, the storage space now, see what we have now, and so you have a good idea as we as we work through the process, uh, and then talk about you know what the needs of the district are. Any other questions from the public? Uh, How will the information be announced about um, the activities of that committee? to the general public so that we can track and be involved? Well, agendas. So we just need to keep an eye on the website? And well, and if, if you sign up for our agenda list, okay. you get the agendas as they come out for all committees and uh, meetings. Or, or soon to be hopefully a new website. Right. Soon. Yeah. With, with featuring a new logo. <laughs> well, hopefully <laughs> we get there. Okay. Any, anybody else out there? Uh, Jim. I, I just have a quick request. Could the screen be blank? Blank <laughs> out <laughs> I, 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 I feel like I'm being... No, no, it's a good point. We're going to be it right back. We're trying to hypnotize you, Jim. <laughs> yeah. I going Jim, it's a subliminal message. I know. <laughs> Go to China. <laughs> okay. Anything Thank you. Okay. So, if, if I'm here in the board, is there more comment? Is there any more comment out there? Any more comment from the board? Do we have a date that we have it going? I mean, we're going to need that yeah. for all the advertising. Yeah. Yeah. And so we could get it. Um, Middle back. of June? July? Actually, <laughs> no. I think it was a J word, January. <laughs> yeah, we'll go out for the month of January and come back to the board for the first meeting when we pick it in February. That work? So the only thing I would, uh, so we're trying to get to the magic number of seven. That's our optimal number is seven. 
I think these five people uh, should know that uh, they are we being considered to and yeah, yeah. We will reach out and to the five people and tell them what we're doing and why. Um, yeah. And in some ways, I guess people through the holidays too, and they don't yeah. have to worry about. But I really don't want to lose anybody that we have, so we will right. outreach to them. Okay. So we'll okay. bring us back to the first meeting in July, or February. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, sure they do it. I'm sorry, I did it. It's contagious. Okay. <laughs> My father used to go through every female name he knew before he ever got to the right one. <laughs> and I'm starting to do kind of crazy stuff like that too. Okay, so we've made that decision. Um, next item. Well, do we need to vote on the five people that we have now? I, I or think, do we just Rick, hold I, I think no, Steve not suggested that we weren't voting right now. Yeah. We're just kind of keeping them in on hold until we go through one more. That's what I heard, anyhow. Yeah, we yeah one that's more what I heard. Yeah. Couldn't we accept those? I think there, it's a good group of some people, it's very diverse, it's got a lot of good talents. You know, I, I don't want to lose those. Well, so I thought I, we'd reach out to them. Holly and I will, will put together a letter and explain, get it sent out to these folks, and, and maybe tell them to start thinking about it. And you know, hurry up and wait. Do yeah. some cheerleading. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I think we do have a good group there. But. I just, you know, the, it's better to let them know that we, we have exactly. accepted them and well, welcomed them than well, more than just. Well, we're not quite accepting them yet. We're accepted as well, candidates. we could accept them okay. if we yeah, want. But then you get into the issue that Holly was talking about, which is if we get five more, and then what do you do, right? And so I think, it, to be fair to everybody, I think Steve's mm -hmm. original suggestion was that. I'm not sure we'll get the same okay. coverage that the press banner gave us the last time. Though the press banner did a pretty good job of getting the word out that we're looking. Um, I was pleased with that, but we'll, we'll give it. Okay. A good try. Well, I didn't see us in their phase and rage section this last issue, so I don't, I don't care. All right. So we're going to move on to yeah. question. Oh. Sorry. Hi. I'm with the press banner. So <laughs> with the press banner. I'm with the press banner. I'm Christina Wise. So. Um, Rick, if you want to give me the exact dates that you're looking at, I'm writing this up no. and I'd love to put them in. We'll get them. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. We're done? We're moving right along. Okay, uh, item uh, 10D, uh, October 24, 2019, the board received an email from Matt Johnston, the environmental coordinator, uh, principal planner for code compliance for the County of Santa Cruz, urging the board to read a link article on glyphosate. Uh, the November 7, 2019 agenda presented uh, the email and full article to the board as written uh, communications. Um, Director Moran, who is on the environmental committee, has written a formal response attached uh, expressing assessment uh, to the email and the article uh, for the board's review and approval. You have that attached and a letter um, from the board uh, for your review and uh, comments. <coughs> so where do we, who do we want to send the letter to? Well, his the letter Bruce, you... uh, to his boss or Bruce McPherson? Well, that's a question for the board. Um, and uh, I spoke with Gina on that a little bit, and, and she had some ideas of, of who we should probably send it to, and I think it was to his immediate supervisor. Well, my, my, this is, uh, there's no rule related to this. My suggestion was simply, um, because it's coming from the board, that it might go to the corresponding leader of the, of the county. So maybe a, a director or... Mr. McPherson, rather than the person's immediate supervisor, but it's really up to the board how they feel politically, you know, is appropriate to address the letter. Mm -hmm. What communication has taken place so far in response to Mr. Johnson's email? Uh, have we, have you or anybody talked to the supervisor or him? Not the supervisor, but I had, I had some unofficial. A conversation with some folks at the county to find out if it is his responsibility to address such issues. 
And I kind of got back a, a lukewarm response saying that we like to work together with the district and, and hope that we have a good working relationship. But that was an unofficial. I did not go to his supervisor. I went to his supervisor. And did we talk to him directly to find out what his kind of came in out of the blue? I wasn't sure what he was trying to accomplish. So like, once again, that everybody wants us to revisit the grant to say that we have a long-standing relationship with Mr. Johnston, and he is critical of many things the district does. Is he contradicting even the Santa Cruz County? Is That's correct. Policy at this point. That's correct. Well, the Santa Cruz County policy though does have uh, a process for exceptions, right. Right. where we we do not at this point. Yeah. Ours is a blanket ban. They have a process which they have exercised on more than one occasion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know exactly the number, but it's 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 definitely more than one. So the, the the net effect is that they have a little bit more of a flex policy where it says ban, but and that's kind of almost the same as allow, right? It's just you go through a process to get to that, and it, it's it looked like it was fairly lengthy and, and involved a lot of people in it, but it's still been exercised. I just was curious what what he was, you know, what, I mean, if, if what he wants to do is reconsider the, the ban, you could always just ask that something to be put on the agenda, I guess. If that's really, and does the county officially want us to do that? Is that, was that an official request from him? Well, no. that's the question we had not been able to get answered. Yet. We don't know. No. I think so. came in on their letter, did right? It came in, came on an e email their uh, official email and his official title was he signed it with his official title. I tried to find out if this was the county's position and no one would address it. I don't believe this is coming from you know the board of supervisors or that type of thing because I think it would be signed by the board of supervisors. I imagine that was probably just a standard email signature. That's correct. Just got thrown on there. That's correct. So, what are we going to do here? Well, um, I just need to go to his supervisor. I go to him, uh, for that matter. But uh, I don't think he needs to uh, represent himself as uh, someone involved in the county uh, planning department uh, or however working for the county. If he's uh, and that's not the county's position. I've tried. I've gone to a number of. Uh, county pest management uh, committee meetings, and uh, they know that I oppose the use of glyphosate, and um, they have uh, less stringent policy. But they also, uh, you know, and the first sentence in their uh, integrated pest management plan is their goal is to uh, eliminate the use of pesticides. And where I was. Working with those people, we were having, I think, a uh, you know successful communication in that, and then I get this kind of right back in my face here, and it, it just I'm quite willing to listen to people who disagree with that, but uh, the county was somebody that, as an organization, we were trying to work towards the same goal, and it just seemed odd, and I want to make sure that uh, he knows it's odd as well. So you you wrote this letter. Yes. Sir. So what would you like to see done? With I would it? like to see it go to him and his uh, immediate superior and CC to uh, Catherine McCloy, who is uh, his the the planning okay. department director. That's who I'd like to see it go to. I don't necessarily think that it needs to go to. Uh, county supervisors, you know, I'm not trying to create a problem here. I'm just trying to prevent a problem. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's not right to be representing yourself in your opinions as that coming from the county. Yeah, and that's that's, what, that's what what a message. Yeah. So that nobody else at the county needs to be sending us, you know, emails on county letter after letters for that matter. Yes. And that would be the message. Yeah. The so, mm -hmm. it, uh, Larry. Oh, thank you. Um, my recommendation is just to drop it. I think you're going to escalate the, you know, this issue. The glyphosate issue has already been settled. It's over. 
And so, um, what, do you, what do you want to do? Get, you know, escalate this into some kind of a conflict where his supervisor has to get involved, and you have to spend a lot more time. We have a lot more important things to do. But let's, let's get on with those things, like a pest management plan. <laughs> well, to answer your question, Larry, uh, what I would like is I would like to be able to open an agenda packet and know what items we're dealing with and not be bombarded with a inflammatory article about glyphosate. Because I read all that stuff. Yeah. I'm reading through this and I'm seeing errors completely in everything and it's an affront to me. And I would prefer to stop that from happening and at the lowest level possible. To talk to him, to talk to his supervisor, that would be it. I don't need, I'm not trying to escalate anything, but this person is um, trying to uh, influence uh, something that I agree is, uh, by and large, a completed issue here. Yeah, but it is. Um, that, that, that's where I stand. I'm not going to go in. Yes, Bob? No. <laughs> Sorry, you don't need to call. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, Bob. <laughs> so I'm wondering would, if we, would, if the third paragraph were not in the letter, would that still accomplish what you're looking for? That's the, so basically you're responding to the correspondence, the subject's email, and basically just reiterating that the county of Santa Cruz has a stated goal, we agree on that, and this is what it is. Uh, I, that, that's fine with me. I don't know. Yeah. I, I think that paragraph is perfectly fine. It's suitable for the nature of what the guy's done. You know, and I don't want to blow it out of proportion either, but I'm just saying, let, let him know, let, his, let the county know that we don't appreciate the county sending us, you know, their opinions on what our policies and using their letterhead unless it is an official communication. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, my thought on that. Yes. I was actually surprised when I went on the agenda and was reading the supporting documents on this topic. It seemed a little bit, um, I guess I just felt like it seemed a little beneath the board um, to respond in that way. I felt like someone was just sharing information and it might be a different perspective from yours, but it just seems like punitive and kind of vindictive and especially since we earlier were hearing these great words about conflict resolution, that seems sort of contradictory to me. Um, and I do, I have friends that have PhDs in environmental science, and just to be clear, I'm not part of any special interest group. I just came here a few meetings ago because I saw a notice about it on next door. And I have friends that are environmental stewards that do land management, and they have told me, I know this is a dead subject for this group, but the cut and dab application, from what I've heard from these very highly educated people whose job it is to manage lands, that that is the environmentally sound way to handle it. And so the fact that someone shared a link to an article with you that he thought supported his perspective, if you can't handle just receiving information and scanning it to see if it's worth it to you and eliminating it if it's not, without going and doing some vindictive thing to this person and trying to get them in trouble with their boss or something. It just, it seems so beneath you folks. I, I, I think part of the issue here is if he would have, as a private citizen, sent this letter, there would be no issue. He sent it as an employee of the county. And that's where it come, becomes an issue. Because he certainly is entitled to his own opinion, but he shouldn't be sending something under county letterhead with his title. It, it's, I, I think that's the problem. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. And I thought that with emails, it might have just been a, like an email signature um, that would automatically include a person's title. And the one other thing that I wanted to just say is, as I was reading it, I read a reference that made it sound like glyphosate is being referred to as a pesticide when it's actually an herbicide. So that's just another point. Well, I, uh, I'm 
Bob had a suggestion to remove the third paragraph. Steve's, I, had, I don't necessarily need to do that. But why uh, would we take out the third no, paragraph? No, I, I don't think we need to either. Because that's just what I was saying. It's a yeah. county, yeah, it came on yeah. county, whatever. Mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, let, let me be clear here. Uh, I'm not trying to be petty about anything here, and I'm not trying to be vindictive. Um, well, I'm trying to work with the county on what our goals are here, and we share common goals. And I'm trying to work with those people, and I've worked with them successfully in stopping the use of glyphosate at the uh, Felton Library. All right? We got them to stop doing that. We've just done our own work here, and uh, there's much more work that we can do with the county as far as uh, reducing the use of glyphosate. And that's what I'm trying to do. And, uh, you know, um, so I'll, I'll just stand on that. Okay. Debbie? Are we still in public comment? Sure. Um, I would like to thank Director Moran for his letter. When I read the memo on it, I expected something a lot more fiery, and I think that it was very level-headed, very professionally done. I think you make your point. I don't think it's overboard at all. I think it's appropriate. I think this district has had to make a lot of effort sometimes to get across to, to everyone that these decisions, including glyphosate and including some other decisions, that are always questioned, has come with a lot of thought and a lot of time into it. And um, I fully support you writing this letter as it is. Thank you. I have just one more comment, if I may. Sure. Okay. Um, irrespective of this letter and irrespective of um, Matt Johnson's uh, article, uh, I went to uh, Scarborough Lumber uh, Ace Hardware in Ben Lomond, where I live. And I went in the lumber yard, this was before Thanksgiving, and there was a big table out there. And um, I went up to the table, and there was a sign underneath it that said, Clearance items. It was all they were on the products. <laughs> <laughs> and then my wife had gone to this uh, Ace Hardware in Scotts Valley, and she said, there's a blank in the pesticide section. All the around their products are being taken away. <laughs> and then today, I went and talked to the people at the uh, Ben Loman Ace Hardware. And I wanted to find out what was going on with this. And they had taken all the Roundup products from all four of their stores. There's two in Scotts Valley and one in Felton. I mean, one in... Um, Ben Loman, one in Boulder Creek here. And I thought, there's four stores that aren't selling Roundup anymore. But as I talked to every time I talked to someone at the Ben Loman station, at the Ben Loman store, it was, first it was uh, just this store, then it was the four stores. And as I talked to the last person, the supervisor there, he said, all of Ace Hardware in the state of California is removing glyphosate. And then and we're round up problems. So I don't I don't need to pick a fight with Matt Johnston or anybody else about glyphosate. The people in, in the stores and the merchants are, are speaking loudly about Roundup products. And I'm not trying to poke anybody, but I'm just trying to work with the county successfully in continuing our goal, our common goal is to eliminate the use of pesticides. So um, I think Matt Johnson should be reminded of that, and I don't need to take it up to the supervisor level. I just think his immediate supervisor should realize that he needs to separate himself from his official tasks in representing the county. So um, when whoever is board president would sign this letter. Okay. All right. Um, okay, let's go on to. We do we need a motion? I have a motion. No, we have a motion to yeah, approve the, the board. Oh, we have to have a motion. As the draft. Okay. Uh, oh, it's 
ourselves ready to find it. I'll move that we um, direct the board president to sign and send this letter um, as drafted in the agenda packet. So it has a title. Okay. I'll second that. Director Ferris? Aye. Director Swan? Yes. Director Pulse? Yes. President Henry? Yes. Director Moran? Yes. Okay. Goodbye, Mr. Johnson. <laughs> Johnson. <laughs> I said Johnson. <laughs> Everybody have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so I, I'm told that this uh, annual financial report will take about 30 minutes. Okay, and the finance manager will do the presentation and she will take it from here. Are you calling the... We can get him a call from the lady because I have some money. The auditor was to come, but he is ill. Yes, the auditor so was going to come. He woke up this morning with flu, so, so, he, so we're going to call him. We don't want his germs. So he pumps himself up with a little go juice. And so I have his presentation. Um, I don't know if we want to call him for the whole thing or if we just want to call him after I get through some of it. That way he can answer questions, whichever. We should probably try and just get him on the phone now. That way, if people have questions along yeah. the way. Yeah, I think so. Okay. 
Um, a little bit about the audit itself. It's broken up into two time periods. Uh, we have what we call interim field work, which is prior to your year end. And at that time, what we're looking at is your internal controls. We're looking at um, um, the documented controls and the processes of how, how transactions are initiated and recorded. We're also looking at uh, the test of controls by testing certain transactions. So on the various accounting cycles, we are testing uh, many transactions and ensuring that they adhere to the internal controls uh, that are in place. Okay. From that, from the results of that testing, we design our audit programs, and audit programs are basically the guidelines that my staff, our staff, utilize when performing the year-end audit, you know, how they're going to go about it, what areas are considered to be risky and such. Okay. At final field work, that's after the year-end, um, the numbers are, are finalized and we've been provided uh, the trial balance. And working with that trial balance, all the account balances, we agree those balances to the supporting documentation. Um, just as an example, <laughs> excuse me, as an example is uh, like your cash balances. We're looking to make sure that the balances agree to your bank statements and reconciliations. We're looking at uh, receivables, the unbilled receivables, the amounts um, that uh, will be billed in that period uh, where the bills have not been sent out yet. We're looking at capital assets that they've been properly recorded <laughs> and such. Uh, we're also performing uh, analysis on the key relationships within those financial statements themselves. Okay. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay, I'm going to go to the next slide. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. There are two documents um, that come out of this process. And the first one is the CAPR. It's the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. Um, it is a, a very, it's an extensive document that adheres to a higher standard of reporting and uh, it's submitted each year for the GFOA award. But within that document itself is the auditor's opinion and I'm reading a little bit of verbatim from the auditor's opinion. It's a, it's a whole page but there's one paragraph that pretty much spells it all out. And it says, in our opinion, the financial statements referred to above present fairly, in all material respects, the financial position of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District as of June 30th, 2019. So that's a clean opinion, so congratulations on that. All right. I'm going to go to the next slide. <clears throat> Okay, I mentioned that were two documents that come out of this process. The first one being the CAPR, in your case. The second one is the management report, and that is the auditor's uh, communication to the board. You, the board, are my boss, not management. I report to you. And within that document, it spells out basically what our responsibilities are, our observations. And if we come across anything that we consider to be a material weakness that should come to your attention, and I'm happy to say that we did not identify any material weaknesses within the district's internal control structure that we felt that needed to be reported to you. Kind of as a side note, we always provide uh, management with comments if we come across small little, you know, uh, not, not really technical items, but we're always interacting with management when we're going through the audit and providing any recommendations that don't, that don't rise to the a level of material weakness, but then you share that with management as well. Can you go to the next slide? <clears throat> and it says, what's new? Yep. Yes. Okay. So what's new in these financial statements is the, the investment that the district has made in the Santa Margarita JCA has been included in the CAPR. Um, and what has been done is a, uh, an adjustment to net position in 2018 and the amount of $30,030 was made. So you'll see a slight adjustment in your net position and 
you'll also see a line item on the statement of net position that shows the balances that represent that investment. And I'm going to see if I can find it real quick and tell you what those numbers are. Bear with me just a moment. Okay, on the actual financial statement, and I don't expect you to pull this up, but on the actual financial statement, you will see it on page 20, and it shows that the investment in Joint Powers Authority for 2019 was 52510 and uh, for 2018 was $30,030. So that's, that's a new item that you're going to see going forward. And that number will change based on the amount that you contribute to the JPA and the results of their operations, your percentage share based on what you contribute to that organization. So it's shown as an investment. Okay, I'm going to go to the next slide. <clears throat> okay. All right. <clears throat> My voice is getting a little bit hoarse, so if you can't hear me, please let me know. Okay. <clears throat> okay, the next slide is the condensed statements of net position. And what that is, is that includes your assets, deferred outflows, your liabilities, deferred inflows, and your net position. And of course, I think we're all familiar with assets are that basically um, uh, uh, cash, receivables, investments, and such. Deferred outflows are amounts that will be applied to your uh, pension and other pension obligations. Um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, post-employment benefit obligations. That's not something that you can really affect, so I won't spend time on that too much. Uh, liability is, of course, what you owe. It's going to be your accounts payable, your accrued amount, and outstanding debt and such. Deferred inflows, similar to deferred outflows, it's really related to pension and other pension obligations, other than pension obligations, I should say. Net position, that represents the net worth. Okay, so that's like your assets minus your liabilities. Uh, but kind of going to the assets, we'll see, we see that total assets increase by approximately, comparing year to year, and I'm just going to kind of round these numbers, 3.3 million. Okay. Deferred outflows actually decreased a little bit, uh, 318,000. And there again, that relates to uh, amounts that have been contributed to the plans and actuarial assumptions um, that are adjusted each year. Liabilities, you can see that it actually went up approximately uh, 1 million, actually 1 million 83,000 and change. And deferred inflows of resources, uh, down approximately 185,000. Um, going to net position, we can see that your net position actually increased year to year um, 2.108 million from the prior year. It's broken up into three distinct categories, your investment in capital assets, it's essentially what you've invested in your capital assets, infrastructure, less than the outstanding debt, and as you pay down the debt and as you amortize, depreciate your assets, that number will change. It will tend to, uh, it'll tend to go down a little bit. Um, but as you're adding new assets, of course, it, it, it'll fluctuate from year to year. Restricted reflects amounts that are being held to uh, pay down debt, certain requirements, loan agreements require you maintain a certain balance to pay the debt. The thing that I'm looking at and, uh, is the decrease in the uh, deficit on the unrestricted net position. So uh, it is negative right now, and this is the result of implementation of GASB 68 and 75, which requires that you put the liability for your pension plan and other post-employment benefits plans on your books. And uh, we're seeing positive. It, it decreased, <coughs> excuse me, from 796,000 to 96,000. So that's a, that's a positive movement of 700,000. 700, so, okay. I'm going to go ahead and move to the next slide. Okay. And I'm just going to touch on this real briefly, and then I'm going to go to the two next slides with, that have these amounts broken out by area. Um, this is the condensed statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in that position. It's like a profit and loss statement. And it sets your revenues, 
expenses, and capital contributions. And we can see looking at the 2019 column, um, here again, I'll go into the revenues and expenses in a little bit more detail in just a second. But uh, we can see right in the middle of the page, net income before capital contributions, and I'm looking in the 2019 column, it's 2036913 So you have positive, excuse me, positive results uh, with regard to uh, your net income before capital contributions. Capital contributions for 2019 uh, were a little bit less than the prior year, and that's due to ongoing projects, developers, uh, contributions, and grants as well. Um, changes in net positions, that represents essentially, we'll call it net profit. So you were positive 2 million, 108,000, <coughs> excuse me, 2 million, 108,538. Working our way down, we can see the total net position at the end of the year, and I'm looking at the very last line item, was 31 million, 227,512. Now I need to go ahead and go to the next slide because they have these amounts broken out by revenues and expenses, and it's just a little bit easier to, to discuss. So go to the next slide. Okay. Okay. This is uh, the sheet that's got all the revenues in it, and this table appears in your CAFR. So you will find this table in the CAFR. Again, it is 2019, 2018, and then a column that shows the change. And when we're looking at total revenues, we can see that total revenues down at the very bottom of the 2019 column was 11464000 which was an increase, and now I'm comparing this to that change column all the way to the right. So it went up from the prior year by 637,000 in change. Now what makes up your revenues are three things, essentially. Your operating revenues are essentially what you do for a living, you know, selling, selling water, uh, wastewater services, and such non-operating revenues, which are going to be kind of the ancillary items, things like property taxes, other assessments, and returns on your investment. So it's considered to be non-operating. And then, of course, capital contributions, grants, and such. But what we can see is on the operating side, we saw an increase in the prior year of approximately 915000 And the largest component of that increase actually was the water consumption sales, that top line item there, it went up approximately 934000 The line items down below it from an audit standpoint are pretty flat, so I won't go into any detail on those. When I say flat, that just means not much of a change from year to year. Working down into the non-operating revenues, there again, uh, property taxes and such, we can see that compared, <coughs> excuse me, Year to year, it went up approximately 85000 from the prior year, <clears throat> with the largest component coming from investment income and property tax. Um, the increase in investment income is pretty consistent amongst all our clients, um, with the increase in rates on um, late, and I know you're invested in the Santa Cruz County Fund and such. The rates have gone up over the past several years, so we're seeing... Um, fairly significant increases um, within those balances. Property tax as well, you know, property values have been going up as well. So as houses are sold, you're, you're realizing the benefit of those higher values. Um, as I mentioned, it went up to approximately 85000 Working down to the next category, um, Capital contributions, there again, amounts that are provided by developers and grants and things like that. It actually went down from the prior year uh, by approximately 363000 to $11,464,000 and change. So, okay. I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, this next slide here contains all your expenses. And there again, same format, operating expenses, basically costs associated with 
what you do, selling water, wastewater services and such, and non-operating expenses, things related to um, debt, interest, and other charges that are not considered to be um, operating, everyday operations. Um, but we can see that uh, total operating expenses, including depreciation, uh, went down approximately 327000 to $8.904 million. The largest components that we see there are in professional services. We have a decrease of approximately 311000 um, We do see a decrease in depreciation and general administrative offset but operational, actually an increase in operational cost of approximately 55000 So the big one that stands out, of course, is the professional services you know, related to accounting, engineering, and such. Non-operating expenses uh, related to interest expense and such uh, actually increased by approximately 406000 And we can see the components... Um, that drive that are really driving that is a loss on disposition of capital assets. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get the detail on that. I was hoping I was going to be able to identify the particular asset that we were talking about, uh, but I don't have that in front of me. Um, Stephanie might be able to help you with that if, if you have questions on that one. I'm not trying to put you on the spot, Stephanie. I do. Do you want to talk about now? Or do you want to talk about? That, that's a one time. Yeah. Yeah, well, the district did more of a dismember an asset like that, you're then having a, a loss on an asset. Okay. Well, that's not okay. recurring. This one, yeah, no, that one, I don't anticipate that to be a recurring number. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry. Appreciate you hanging in, man. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm surprised my voice is still here. I, I, I'm feeling good. I'm kind of jazzed, actually. <laughs> right now. Just keep taking the go juice. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay, so kind of big picture here. Total expenses uh, were 9.5 million and change, which actually went up approximately 79,000 from the prior year. So big picture, kind of flat, looking at everything in the aggregate. Um, so I'm going to kind of go back to one page here. I'm going to go back three pages to this condensed statement of revenues and expenses and changes in net position. Let me know when you're there. Yep. Okay. I don't really want to go into detail, just kind of a recap. Um, I, I had a long conversation with Andy Beck, who was the manager, kind of slash partner on the engagement. And he said the engagement went, went very well. Staff was very responsive. Um, and he extends his thanks to everybody was, that was involved. Uh, so the, the engagement went well. Um, with regards to the management report, there again, we did not have any material weaknesses that we felt needed to be brought to the board's attention. So congratulations on that. Um, we fully expect you to you know, receive the award for the GFOA in 2019. Um, positive results. Um, yeah. I'm saying positive results, but that's kind of uh, subjective. Uh, it kind of really depends on what your expectations were when you're building your budgets and such. But we did have positive results of approximately $2.1 million as well. So that, in essence, is my report. And I just, once again, uh, I'm sorry it can't be that. I was really looking forward to coming up, but this kind of hit me. So um, definitely want to be there next year. Do you have any questions? I'll say, does the board have any questions about any of the different sections or sometimes some of these GASBs? Like there wasn't, a, there wasn't any new pronouncements. The last year and the year prior had some of the newer GASB pronouncements that caused, you know, that we needed to have a lot more discussion. 
this is kind of a more normal audit? Yes, yes. We'll call this an off year, okay? Yeah. Um, it, several years funded. ago, did 68, which puts the pension obligation on your books, which is a major hit for all governmental entities. And then last year was OPEP, that was GASB 75. This year, there was nothing new that applied to you. Uh, next year, I believe, is going to be GASB 87, but I don't believe you have any capital or leases that are going to cause you much grief. But that's the next one. For large counties uh, or counties and cities that have large leased fleets of vehicles and other assets, it's going to be very significant. But I don't, I don't expect it to affect you significantly in any way. So. so really, there's only a couple of restatement things that we've had For to this year, For the this only year. restatement was the JPA. JPA. And essentially Correct. what that was, was because gotcha. um, it was new you know, for, for last year's audit. And so the money we contribute, the member agencies, essentially at the end of the year, whatever money the JPA has sitting in the books, if the JPA were to end, each member agency should be getting back their respective share. Therefore, we should be reflecting that on our books. So JPA doesn't have to reflect anything differently, but we should be, and so that's where that 30,000 and then the 50 some thousand um, came from. So that was, only that was only restatement for the last year. Correct, correct. And that was run through 2018 and did not affect your 2019 results. So. Okay. Any other questions? Does anyone in the audience have one that you think the auditor, that you would like to ask the auditor specifically? I can always try and... Well, oh, hang on, we got one question from Lou. That nexus issue of 2.1 million, is that basically reserves? Or, or where does that net position end up? Um, okay, so the net position, okay, hang on one second, let me go to the right page. Yeah, it's not that page, but it's, it's, okay, the change in net position, that represents your, the revenues that you receive less your expenses, that is, equates to what your net revenue was. Okay, so where does, does it equate, that? it doesn't necessarily equate to cash, because you bought Asset using some of that money, but it represents your net profit is what it really represents. Um, so now, Chris, in this case, so I went back up to the condensed statement of net positions, and our restricted increased about 1.6. Yeah. The majority of that is the probation tank loan money coming in that's restricted for that project. So that aspect of it is not, you know, that's not cash that the district has to spend on any, you know, it's going to be going towards a, a certain capital asset. Um, the 700000 now that is where, you know, you are building up a little bit more. Yeah. So you're saying that did go to reserves, or some of it, or most of it? Yeah. Hopefully all of it? Yeah. A big portion of it, yes. I, I'm looking at the statement of cash flows. On, I'm actually looking at the, the financial statement itself, and I'm looking at the statement of cash flows. And what it's showing is that you have cash broken out into two different line items on the financial statement. Cash that is not restricted I and mean cash that is restricted. And as Stephanie indicated, a, a fairly significant portion of that went into the restricted portion. Your total cash is uh, three million two hundred seventy-four thousand five hundred and seventy-one, and it increased. Okay, that that's this year. Okay, last year it was one million three hundred thirty-two thousand and forty-nine dollars. So you can see it's approximately two million dollars right there. It's a little bit less, but let's just for round, argument purposes, let's just call it that. So you're up about two million dollars there. A significant portion of that actually is in that restricted that is going to be used for the project and pay down debt. Your unrestricted cash, cash that you can use for whatever purpose you want, um, uh, based you know, on the board's direction, um, at the end of the year was $1,043,351. Okay. 
which is up by approximately 300,000 from the prior year. So does that say about half of it went to reserves? Which is intention to go towards capital assets, but yeah, I mean, yep. So I mean, it's good, it, it's good. It's moving us out of the deficit. Some of the different, you know, pronouncements are what drove us into the deficit. Um, when you look at the water versus sewer fund, the water fund is actually out of the deficit. The remaining is coming from the sewer fund, which should start to mitigate itself. They had, you know, they have two more years of 20% increases each year in their rates. Um, so it's all very positive signs. I would concur with that, yeah. All right. Well, we'll let you get off the phone and uh, Go get better. feel better. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, 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 I had a good time, actually. <laughs> Thank you very much, and have a good evening. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> okay, so, that was, so that was the auditor's um, presentation of it. There is a pass out and the board got it as well. Um, we went through and found non-financial stuff. We found some little tweaks that we're gonna make to some of the wording. Um, it came from the Budget and Finance Committee and a meeting with uh, Director Foltz, myself and the district manager. All good little wording things to elaborate in certain sections. One of the main ones, um, when you're seeing it stating our capital assets are sitting at you know, $30 million, that's based on whatever the cost was back at the original time. It is not what the replacement cost is going to be, um, which obviously some of our assets go for 30, 40, 50 plus years. So it's going to cost a lot more when we go to build those again. Um, so you can kind of go through that list to see some of the different changes that we're going to make. We're going to elaborate in different areas. Some of the loans, we're going to get it so that the wording's clear throughout the document. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other major ones that stood out to me. Um, but in general, the audit document is, I don't want to downgrade its importance. It's obviously very important, but it's kind of a done document. I mean, it is the financial audit of the district. It's required. Um, so this one is a little bit more of a formality. The board gets a lot more involved with the budget process. Um, but then always looking at the, having the audit and being able to go back and look back and get a good, clean opinion from the auditors. Like, that's all stuff that you definitely want to make sure, you know, we're getting. Um, one of the areas that we do have a little bit more control over is the statistical section, where a lot of times you'll see some of the 10-year trends. Um, that's kind of uh, a nice thing that we added that's part of what the CAFR is versus just a regular financial audit. Um, so the statistical section does give a lot more background on some of these historic trends, not just the two-year look, but a 10-year look. 10-year customer base, 10-year water sales, you know, a lot of that different type of stuff that can help someone coming in fresh maybe understand what's going on with our district a little bit more, a little bit of the history. That's a lot of work to put that together, and it's really great to appreciate it. You did a good job. Thank you. Any other award this year? Hopefully we do. We, yes, I was like, we, we uh, do. If we approve it tonight, right? Then you can get them. Yeah, then I'll go ahead and I'll submit. I'll submit for us to get our CAFR award again. So we just make a motion. If anyone has any other questions, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's uh, adopting the report. Two comments and a question. First of all, the background, the three pages of background that you start with, that was really helpful. Thank you. I mean, that helped a lot to demystify the next hundred pages that yes. I went through. So I found that very, very helpful to share. The second one, it, it's a small point, but uh, under your mission statement, I've been here six months now, and you still have my name spelled wrong. So I, really like I don't know why, but change that. So it's oh. not F-E, it's F-A. I'm very sorry. That's that's what. Okay. Good <laughs> <laughs> Let them do that, and then 
Um, the last one. It, and then the Rel Rick Moran is currently sitting on the board. This document is <coughs> as of 6.30. So yeah. that was one of the other main switches. switches. Which, yeah. It's going back to Bill Smallman being one of the other ones. You were here as of 6.30. Next year. Next year, Rick will be on that. And then the question is, on page 104 um, in the detail, you go over 10 years of numbers, the last 10 years, fiscal years. And the operating revenue from 2010 was 4.5 million. The operating revenue from 2019 was 10.1 million. The operating expense in 2010 was 4.3 million. The operating expense in 2019 is 7.3 million. Bottom line is that the revenue went up 224% in 10 years. But the expenses also went up almost as much, 170%. And you're in one of the statistical pages? Uh, yeah, page 104, I believe. 104 at the bottom. Sorry, yeah, there's yeah. so many numbers on these. <clears throat> and if you look at the operating... 104 at the bottom. 104 of the... It's the big no. Oh, well, there's, there's like you're getting close. I think you were looking at this one where it has it in these ones. Yes. Sorry, it's hard for you guys to see, but yes. So it is going from so 2010 through 2014 is on one page, and then right. it goes to the next page. Right. For that. But yes, the operating. Sorry. Right. The operating income in 2010 was a negative 1.2 million. The operating income in 2019 is a positive 1.4 million. So overall, the trend is heading in the right direction. But here's my question. I don't know if you can answer it, but I would like you to kind of put it on your drum and think about it, is that given the fact that, that our, our revenue is, is always go, or has been going up over the last 10 years, but our expenses has also been going up by almost the same amount, we have two more years of rate increases. And then that's it. Then what we have is what we have every year. And yet, expenses seem to be keep going, seem to keep going up. So my question is, where are, where do you think we're going to be five years from now in terms of financial sustainability? When when the revenue stops going up, if the expenses continue to go up, do we end up with a problem somewhere down the road? <laughs> so. If you look at the 20 years of the district's rate increases, only about half of those years have a rate increase. Oh, I understand that. So, yeah. So, the, I mean, so, the $11 million dollars so, from the Waterman Gap went toward yeah, so doing the, those rate increases. That's the hard increases. part. Is so while we're seeing a lot of operating income coming in now, and we will more with next year and the year after, a lot of it is going towards capital. A lot of it is going to be going towards, you know, some of the operating expense increases. Obviously, inflation makes it very difficult for a company to keep their operating expenses flat. I feel that this last rate increase with the projections that they have for capital and operating expenses should be what's getting us to the point where we have more nominal needed rate, rate increases, like inflationary only type of rate increases in the future. Actually, what I'm most concerned about is the uh, depreciation or amortization, because you know I, the 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 top, the top two issues for me are infrastructure and financial sustainability, and they're and I'm kind of on the horns of a dilemma, mm -hmm. because I want the infrastructure and I want it now, and we've got it. We took one bite for 15 million. I'm hoping when we get rid of some old debt, we can go back for another 15 million in three years and pr pretty much make a significant dent in our crumbling infrastructure. At least that's that's my hope. So we're kind of at that pendulum swing where all of our infrastructure but, is now aging. But that as we borrow money and have to pay that back, you know, and maybe that's not operating expense. I don't know where you put it, but the, the point is, you know, my second priority is financial sustainability. So I'm kind of arguing with myself here. You know, so I would like to know where you think we're going because I don't know. I, I just see one going, one you know, flattening I, out, and the other one I don't know. But if we, if I follow history, I think we might have a problem. I think what do you the think? district utilizing debt to pay for these extremely long-term assets is a very good thing. Yes. The fourteen point five that we did, we have another large chunk of debt getting paid off um, in September of twenty twenty one. 
which is going to probably fall in line with when the district should be going out for probably some more debt for some of this capital asset. Um, so, I mean, I would imagine the district's depreciation expense slash capital improvement projects is going to continue to grow um, in these upcoming years. And all that means is that more capital assets are being put in the ground. I think, Lou, really you're, you're on the right track. Um, I think we need to do just a little bit more, though, and that's one of the things that Stephanie alluded to in the supplemental note she sent out, but I don't think we want to do it this year. It's, it, there's, I don't think we want to do it for this report. I think for this year, what we need to do is assemble a complete picture of our deferred and unfunded liabilities, which include uh, vacation, OPEB, pensions, SCADA, meters, um, deferred maintenance, <coughs> And then the big one, which is the inventory um, report with metadata, hopefully, that gives us a picture of what the replacement costs going forward are, are going to be, not just the historical capital cost, but what we're looking at going forward. And that needs to be summarized for the, for the community to be, and, and for us, to be able to see what we are um, looking at with respect to where money needs to go. I think once we have that kind of clear picture, or clearer picture, obviously it's not going to be exact. The master plan is going to be a huge, a, a huge part of that. But, but there's also the other items as well. And I think once we have that, we're going to be in a much better position to be able to really start doing um, multi-year planning and looking forward in a way that I, I don't think the district or board has been able to do historically, uh, because that information hasn't been um, readily available. So over the course of the next year, in, in preparation for the next audit report next year, I'm hopeful that we can get our hands around those numbers. Because I think, I think they're going to be, uh, certainly the uh, infrastructure replacement costs, that's going to be a really big number as they're sitting there going, yep. So, um, I, you know, it's, it's nine figures, and, and it's a question of how big in the nine figures, right? So that's, that's something, I think, for everybody to start getting their arms around. I guess what came up for me was uh, when I started looking at those numbers, I came across that page. It reminded me of a media release I read recently from Soquel Creek Water District, in case you haven't read it. They just got approved for a $50 million grant from the state because they are so critically overdrafted because of saltwater intrusion. And they need the money, and I'm glad they got it. But they're also adding on top of that another $36 million loan at low interest rate. They're investing $86 million in, in infrastructure next year. Um, if I go back to Brian Lee estimated that the amount of money it would take to totally fix our infrastructure in 2015 was $60 million. I hope he was wrong. Uh, I don't know what, it is, what it's going to be. I know that you know, we suddenly have this, this new thing for, for the Lion um, Facility Road that could be as much as $15 million. So the cha-ching keeps going up, and I keep worrying about, I know we need to do it, but how are we going to pay for it, I guess? Once fine. we get like the master plain, plan and plain. some of that stuff, we'll be able to do a more realistic 10-year prediction. Yeah, first, first step is let's get the information, right? And then we can start worrying. So in the meantime, just stop worrying? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, from a, right, stop, from a financial like standpoint, the rate increase help us get that $14.5 million. But it expires in two years. Right. This we order. still could have borrowed even more than that. Um, so, I mean, we still will be looking in a couple years to use that leverage to go and get another another loan. You have to, I mean, you have to have presentations for, I mean, you have to have the projects and all of that different stuff, you know, kind of a roadmap um, when you go out for the financing. So, like this last one, the USDA loan that we were going to get already provided us with all of that information that allowed us to then easily go with projects for that 14.5 but i mean these are the right progressions when you look at our trend for us to be getting a much healthier position because what i really really don't want to do in two years is to start the process for another rate increase I really don't want to do that. I mean, I not another larger, but I mean, but that's the, I mean, but it's, it's the, it's the I, I know, I mean, the, right, absolutely. We'll do it that when we get no there, but I mean, it's the catch 22. If you don't, if you do small 2% ones for, sure. for a couple years, that can get.
get you along versus if you do none, then all of a sudden you're going to end up having to have a 10% here. So, I'd, I'd rather borrow money or find other sources of revenue, which we are thinking about, than to do that. That's just, okay, I've said it. The other thing, Lou, is we need to know what our life expectancy is on all our infrastructure. And once we know what the life expectancy is, then it gives us a lot better idea of what kind of money we need to, and, and what, what's, uh, how, how big of a percentage is, is the cost of, let's say, a tank. So the tank has what, 45, but it's, there's, they're metal tanks now, but they live longer than redwood. So what is the life expectancy? If you maintain them. If you, maintain them, if you take good care of them. Okay. That's a bad example. But, uh, <laughs> Pipes yeah. on the other hand. Pipes, okay. That, that's, it, it's all about life expectancy and looking down the road and saying, hey, that pipe is going to cost us X amount of dollars, we think, in 15 years. And so how do we start getting the money uh, by the time the 15 years are up? And, and that kind of helps us figure out how much money we need. we we got to have that kind of information figure out how much money we really need. So what you're saying is by the next budgeting cycle, we might have an answer to that question. We know <clears throat> about financial sustainability. Uh, I'm about to be sending out my internal budget reports next oh. month. So uh, well, the year no, from now? but yes, the year from yeah, right? is, when, is when the master plan is going to be done. I mean, we'll, yeah. we will eventually yeah. know what life expectancies our infrastructure has. So we're right. in the middle yeah. of the master plan that's projected to complete sometime in 2020. Yeah, yes. at the end of 2020. Yeah. yeah. So this so. upcoming budget, it won't. We won't have those plans. Yeah. So. But in a year, I can remind you. Yeah. Uh -huh. One number that really left off the page for me is the difference between the water produced and water sold. Yeah. So it's, it's for me, it's one of the key metrics that, that I like to look at. And this year, it was 35 percent. And so what that means is that we're extracting a lot of water out of the watershed for surface water and all that that we, we don't actually sell. It, and it's not all leaks. Um, you know, we need to get a handle on what that component is. But that number is up about 13% from just a few years ago. And so what I think that's also indicative of at some level is our infrastructure is aging. And as it ages, it's going to are places that are going to leak. And between that and the other water we use for internal purposes like flushing, that's a pretty substantial overhead that, we, uh, that, that we're looking at right now. And so something that, something that infrastructure will address, because then we're not pulling as much water out of the watershed as we are now. We really but we're also getting water. better at, at, I mean, I thought we had reduced the amount of water we we're losing due to leaks by 20%. No, it was 8% of the annual year that leaked a detection program we had, if you added that 8% to the 35, you'd be at 43. That just took us down to 35. Now, again, it's not all leaks. No. We'll put right. together a report for the breakdown. We sit here and, and try to guess of what that percentage is, and I'm not quite sure that's the percentage, but we'll, we will look at that percentage of the breakdown. I'm just going by what's in the... I, I totally agree with you, Bob. That's what's, what's in there, but there's several ways of looking at it. Okay. So, can we have a, a motion and a vote? Or did we get a motion and a second already? Um, was there a public comment? Um, I, think, I thought that they already had, were asked questions, but go ahead. Can I ask just information? There was a line about property tax. Do you take in property tax? Yes. There are certain areas of the district I don't remember the year. I want to say it was the 70s or 60s when the property tax thing passed. Something like that. So any parcels that were part of the district, similar to Juan Pico, um, they do, we do get a small portion of the property tax revenue from those parcels. So Juan Pico was around back there as, as well. Um, and 
and so some parcels we do receive a small amount of property taxes. So the Felton area that came on, you know, more recently that wouldn't. Um, they weren't a special district. That's exactly. Yeah, they weren't a special district. Yeah. Long Pico was a special yeah, district. The taxes were fully appropriated when the Felton came on. We would have to negotiate with the county, and the county wouldn't negotiate. Yeah. I, I'm surprised and shocked by that. Thank you. And, um, the increase in loss, is that due to the drought and that um, more water leaked out because the water table was lower, perhaps? There was yeah. The majority of the increase in that is due to melt, well maintenance these last few years, well failures. And there's a lot of flushing of the wells during the maintenance and rehab of these wells. And I was asked to dig into that by the manager, and that's kind of where I found a lot of problems. Well, these numbers need to be these numbers need to, to have some of these different maintenances and process water removed from that number because it, it makes it look like we're losing that water, and uh, we do have reasons to be using. There's a lot of flushing. There's a lot of different water. Without a breakdown, it looks like yeah, we just added to the statistical report. And where yeah, it's, it's going, thing. and where it's yeah. going and being flushed to, it's going back into the aquifer. Sure. We are having to pay to pump that water. Right. So it shouldn't be metered. It, it shouldn't, shouldn't show up on these reports. Mm. I think but it has I think to actually well, it should. It, it just needs to be broken out. Yes. That's you just what. explained the variance. Yeah. Then. You know, this much was due to flushing. This much yeah. was due. But to I, I think it. I mean, we definitely want to know water produced versus water sold, and then the reason for that. Absolutely. At least my opinion, I think that's yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that Mr. Rogers is just saying that it's not produced and put into the It's not put into the distribution system. It's, it's just being pumped. It's right going to a meter, and it's, it, it's actually inflating our numbers. But yeah. we, can, we can break it down so it doesn't inflate the numbers. Because there is an actual unaccounted for water loss, and that's probably 15 to 18 percent, at least, where we lose the un unknown leakage. Um, but, but, it's a report that we'll get to. Are you done asking <clears throat> your questions? Just one more. When you talk about the water produced, are you saying that it was treated water or just pumped out of the well? And yeah, I mean, if produced is treated water and water that's pumped through a well. So maybe when you're flushing, you're using untreated water? No, you're yeah, using treated water products. during flushing, but flushing a well is completely different. That's to clean up the well to be able to pot the water. So we can't actually put the water into the system until it's flushed and cleaned in the well and passes all the bacteriological tests. In. All right. I, I, I've lost track. Do we have a motion and a second or no on this? Okay. I move that we uh, approve the uh, annual financial report for fiscal year 2018-2019. I'll second that motion. Okay. Holly? Director Ferris? Aye. Director Swan? Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. President Henry? Yes. Director Moran? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. So the next item is the election of, of officers and well, uh, the ordinance of selection of officers. The board president will entertain nominations for the position of board president and vice president. The board will review and vote on the elections of officers. The elected president will then take the gavel. So, first of all, we go out to the public, uh, and you can comment uh, about the board president. Um, you, don't, you don't get to make a nomination. Uh, you don't get to vote. You can just comment right now, and <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I've never used this all year long. <laughs> but hopefully I will have no reason to use it. So out to the public, um, any comments that you want to make um, about the next board president or 
whatever. You don't have to comment. You can just listen, whatever you want. Larry? <coughs> Thank you. Um, I, I do have a, an opinion about uh, who should be the next president. And I, it's, I realize that it's not a no nomination and I don't get to vote, but I would like to tell you who I think should, should be the next president. <clears throat> I think it should be either you, President Henry, or it should be Director Fultz. Um, and, I mean, I'm sorry, I meant Ferris. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I meant Director Ferris. Um, <clears throat> the reason is that I think both of you have demonstrated to me over the last six months or so that I've been active here that you have um, a balanced perspective, you have the capability to balance the opposing opinions, including those that you hear from, from the, uh, the public, including myself. Um, you're inclusive, you, you want to have um, people who have opposing views uh, participate, not just listen. Um, you uh, are collaborators and you're positive. And um, so those things are very important to me, and I think both of you would make uh, really good presidents. And uh, that's who I'd like to. That's who I'd like to see. If one was the president and the other was the vice president, that would work fine for me. Thank you. Anybody else want to make a comment? Uh, yeah, Deborah Lawrence. Um, I think that. Anybody else? If, with you stepping down in the rotation, which is normal for this board, anybody else would be very good at it. Um, I've written a letter that's in the packet. I would like to uh, put in a word for Bob Foltz, only because I have seen him. He is the chair of two committees, and he's been on the budget uh, committee as a, the citizen member for an additional, I think, two or three years. Admin committee. Admin sorry. Um, as far as, and I think equally fulfilling what your requirements are, it's an admirable job of working with many different views from the public and, and incorporating that in the discussion and being open to hearing all the views and things. Um, Steve would be great, Bob would be great, Lou would be great. We are, we have a wealth of, of really qualified candidates here, but in this case, I think Bob, the tradition is for the vice president to move into the chair position. It's, it's a tradition, and it's, it's very well established, and there's a reason for it in getting up into the administration part of, of running the district. So I would like to see Bob, and then I would like to see Lou as vice president, because I think you're the next president for next year. Thank you. Anyone else have a comment out there? Sure. I guess I'll add my two cents. In the spirit of, of you know, helping the board to be its best and, and also you know, building on the early, what I found to be inspirational you know, actions of the board, I just want to urge everyone to, to take this very seriously. I think all five board members you know, clearly have strengths and, and not surprisingly those strengths are different. The flip side of that is that not everybody's going to perform identically as board president. And, you know, the mental exercise that I try to perform here is if, if I were really responsible for hiring someone to be board president, you know, I, I know I would take a very careful assessment of the different candidates and I would try and weigh their qualities. And I would try and pick whoever I think is going to bring out the best in the board. I don't think I'd want to be defaulting to, you know, kind of, um, you know, protocols like, oh, whoever was vice president, I'd really want to give it a fresh examination. And I'd want to figure out who I think has demonstrated, you know, the, the most successful commitment to good practices, best, pro best practices, open you know, inquiry, receptivity, incorporating everybody's knowledge and opinions across the board, the staff and the public. Because that's that's what I see the board doing really well, and I hope it continues to do that. And, and I hope that whatever choice you make is enables you to do that more effectively. Thank you. Any anybody else? 
Elaine? Um, I have I've worked with um, you, Director Fultz, and, and Director Ferris, and a little bit of Director Moran in the Environmental Committee. Um, I've also had meetings with you, Director Fultz, and you, um, Director Ferris, and I have found that both of you have given a lot of your time, and I appreciate that. The difference I feel is that I haven't felt as listened to or understood um, by you, Director Fultz. And I feel that um, I have often been labeled as the opposition. And really, I, j I just speak for myself. I am concerned about the environment. I think that you can't separate environment from water and the health and of our water. Um, so I, I don't understand how, how those can be separated. I was especially struck by your, in April we had an environmental meeting about the um, Upper Zayanti Stream Wood Enhancement Project, which was completely funded. There was no expense required <coughs> by the um, district. And I, you just kept, Director Fultz, coming up with objections to doing it. And I, I, I really, I felt like uh, tearing my hair out and running out of the room. It was very frustrating. And I, I, I went home trying to understand what your objection was. Uh, um, eventually you did pass and you did say yes to it. But, um, so those are two things. And two things is, is, is that where I prefer Director Ferris, I feel like he has listened to me and valued my input and, um, and not divided the community into us and them. And I just think that's really important. Anybody else? Yes. I really hesitate to speak because you're all really valuable people, and I don't usually like to get personal. But I, I, I'm just kind of echoing a little bit of my concern when directors personally attack others in the paper um, a couple weeks ago that um, Director Fultz did. I, I feel setting up that sort of us-them dynamic is just not helpful. It's like what got me sort of interested in becoming involved and coming to these meetings is that I think, well, I want people in our community to get along, to work with each other. And I feel that I've met with you and he listens and he actually changes his mind based on what he hears. Um, and I think that's a really valuable asset to have on a public body. It, the, this public body represents all of us. We are the bosses. We are all, all you know, the bosses. And so if you're not listening to the people, um, it, you're not doing your job. And, and so, um, I don't know, I'm just going to say that. Anybody else? Okay. I, I would like to make a motion that Steve Swan becomes the next board president. Is there a second out there? Second that motion. Okay. Any comment? Did I get to comment on my motion or not? Uh, yes, any board member can comment. Okay. Any comment? Um, yes, I don't know how to put this in here. I had another member in mind. So, uh, can I speak to that? I guess we, but we have a motion and a second. So yeah. Um, you can say that you don't want to vote for it or whatever. Um, well, I, I don't know. I don't know ex exactly how to how to put this. Is I had another person in mind. Oh, right. Okay. So that that is why, you know, if I get an opportunity to say who that person is. Well, you can make an amendment to the motion. Okay. Um, my amendment to the motion would be. Um, Wait a second. Okay. No. Yeah. Let me let me just clarify this a little bit here. So. Um, 
Can there be First more? First of all, you could make any comments you want that would be germane to the motion, which could include saying that you supported somebody else instead of the person who is. Okay, that's what I want to do. And, but then um, in terms of amending, I don't think amendments will work here because uh, the amendment wouldn't really, if you're, it, it's going to be one candidate or another, <laughs> so it wouldn't really be germane to the original motion to <coughs> try to substitute someone else's name. Okay. So, um, in this process, I was going to uh, nominate Bob Fultz, and the reason being that he received more votes than any other candidate, and out of respect for those people who voted for him and the electoral process, I would have chosen Bob Fultz. Mm -hmm. Any other comment by board members? We have a motion. And we have a motion and a second. You want to call the question? Director Ferris. Aye. Director Swan. Yes. Director Falls. Yes. President Henry. Yes. Director Moran. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Congratulations. Steve. You can stay where you are, Lois. We can just move this. Where do you want to sit? You want to go on my seat? Yeah. Yeah. Why do you want to sit? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and in this case, I'll just do the appointing of the vice president, correct? Yeah. You can do a recommendation. Call for, uh, call for, no, call for motions. For motion. Yeah. Yeah. Or you can make a motion. Is there any public comment that would be warranted at this point? Mm -hmm. I could go back out mm -hmm. for public comment, but I think comments were directed to all Move. Okay. Yeah. Then I'd like to make a uh, nomination a motion that uh, Lois be the vice president for the coming year based on her experience and helpfulness. And I think she'll be a tremendously valuable vice president in this capacity. Yes, Bob. You know, I think one of the things that, that we also need to look at in terms of um, board development is also leadership roles and moving the leadership roles around. So I think that um, it would be better if we pass that. Um, Lois has had a year as, as president. I think it would be great to pass that as president slot to somebody that can then develop into potentially being next year's president. And I think that that way everybody has an opportunity for leadership and the uh, on the board. I, I would agree with you. Although in this case, I'm more interested in my development and <laughs> <laughs> to rely on somebody with uh, at least uh, five or six years of experience on two different water boards as president. So that's my, my choice. But your point is well taken. I, I just think we need to, I think you're going to do fine. I don't, um, in my role as vice president, there was really very little involvement in any, of the, um, in any of the activities. My role mainly was to step in if there was a reason where the president could not um, chair a meeting for whatever reason. Uh, but in terms of setting agendas, that sort of thing, there are um, Brown Act issues, that sort of thing. But it's more being able to um, get into that role, and that way we can pass batons on to other folks as well. Uh, ask them to consider. I appreciate your comments. Nevertheless, I'm still going to select Lois as the vice president. Well, this would be a motion. No, no. Is there a second? Yeah. 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 I guess I can second it. It's not an illegal motion. Might not pass. <laughs> okay. Shall I call the vote? Please. <laughs> Director Fair. Excuse me, Director Ferris. 
Abstain. Director Swan? Yes. Director Falls? Abstain. President Henry? Yes. Director Moran? Out of respect for Steve's choice, I say yes. Motion passes. And what's next on our list? We uh, on item 11 see the uh, board of directors meeting dates, times, and location for calendar year 2020. Um, it's uh, recommended that the board discuss and adopt the meeting schedule for 2020. The recommendation of staff is to hold a regular scheduled board of directors meeting at the operations building. Unless there is a reason to believe that a larger space is required, then it would be held at Highlands uh, Park Senior Center. It is also recommended that uh, it's also recommended that the regular scheduled meeting continue to be on the first and third Thursday of every month at 5:30 p.m. Open sessions convening at 6:30 p.m. unless uh, holidays or other unforeseen events cause change. It is further recommended that the first board of directors meeting in January be moved to January 9th, 2020, due to the New Year's uh, holiday. Uh, that is how it's been done in the past. The, the board may select any meeting dates they want, and the second page in is a calendar uh, with uh, the proposed or recommended uh, meeting dates. So I'll turn it back over. Well, our current board policy calls for there to be um, one meeting, I think, in July and November and December, due to holiday schedules um, and the fact that it's very likely people will be out of town and available during that time. And so if we were going to make it every first or third Thursday, we would need to change the board policy. And, um, I think there is both monetary and also just schedule issues, which is probably considered. The board did enact that policy change. So I would amend that. I would make a motion that we adopt. First, I would make a motion that we adopt in accordance with our current board policy. Uh, first and third Thursdays, except for January, where it's moved to the ninth. Uh, July, where we don't have a meeting on the second. November, where we don't have a meeting on the 19th, and December, where we don't have a meeting on the 17th. I would second that motion. Okay. Is there any public comment on this? Okay. Holly, do you have any thoughts? Director Ferris? Cool. Wait, wait a sec, we have a resolution. Yeah, there's, a resol uh, there's, so, there's a resolution. So I'm sorry, I need to restate mine. Um, so this resolution, I move that we adopt resolution number 13, 1920, setting regular board of director meetings for 2020 as the first and third Thursdays of every month, except for January, where it's the uh, 9th, July, where we have no meeting on the first Thursday, and November and December with no meeting on the second, uh, the third Thursday. Part of the problem, if I, can I say something? Sure. I, I'm not used to raising my hand. Go right ahead, Lois. <coughs> when we only have one meeting in November and one meeting in December, look at this agenda. It just became a nightmare. Well, if there's so much stuff on this agenda, either we need to think about some of this stuff could go to January instead of coming to December. Or we get the end of the report out faster, which I know is something that Stephanie is talking well, about. Well, but that didn't too. take that long. They, it was, no, it didn't take that long. Yeah, it didn't. It just, if I quick interject, one of the uh, one of my lessons, one of my many lessons I've learned this year, that we have had issues with our planning of board agendas. And uh, the district secretary and I have discussed this, and we will be putting together 
a much long range schedule that will look at, for instance, we should have been reviewing committees three months ago for charters mm -hmm. and discuss them before we went out on committees. So I think you're going to see very soon a proposed uh, agenda list for the full calendar year that addresses the issues that uh, Director Henry is saying. Because I'm not happy with it either. I feel that we, that some of our agendas got loaded too much last minute. There was, a, there was some issues. And, and some were very light. And some were very light. And, and so, uh, but, and so it allows some of the staff timing too that we have to get done. But I think we will, it will be a goal of mine to get out very soon in the district secretary a, a much better plan. Well, I made, I made a motion if there is no second, then. Well, I can second it if you want me to second it. Well, I will, I will repeat. Second, but the reason why is we can always have a special yeah. Yeah. meeting. So it's, right. it's sure. not like it's, we have to wait and, and let things build up. So and we've had, and we've had special meetings. Yeah. But, yeah. And, and this is the first year we have to review policies, and there is we learned some some good lessons on, on how to plan, and we will be planning that very shortly and, and get it to you all. And another reason is that if we if we don't do this now. The odds are good that we will change it again later and <laughs> disclose those dates that Bob just mentioned. So, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Fine. okay, Director Ferris. Aye. President Swan. Yes. Director Falls. Yes. Director Henry. Yes. Director Moran. Yes. Yes, uh, the next item we have is 11D, is the board member uh, committee appointments for 2020. Staff recommends that the board uh, review the membership assignments of the existing committees and by motion of the board, approve board committee assignments for 2020. Now, these are just looking at board members on committees. And uh, for background, uh, standing committees, right now it's uh, the administrative, Mr. F uh, Director Fultz and Director Henry. The Budget and Finance Committee is uh, Director Fultz and Director Henry. The en Engineering Committee is Director Ferris and Director Moran. The Environmental Committee is Director Ferris uh, and Director Moran. The multi-agency body, the Santa Margarita Committee, is Director Ferris, Henry, and Moran as the author. Yes, Willis. Uh, could I make a motion to leave the committees the same, the board members? It seems to me like Lou and and Rick here are perfect where they are, and that kind of leaves Bob and me up for the other two. I guess I'd like to have some discussion. Yeah, right. well, I was just going to say. I, I'm just like saying. To, yeah, no, I, I, I like that with the with the exception. One of the things we don't denote is the chairmanship. Of the oh, don't bring that up. We should. Uh, and I, I am certainly happy to continue uh, being on both the engineering committee and the environmental committee. Uh, but I would like to offer that uh, I think Rick Moran would probably be a better choice for the environmental committee chair because he has far more credentials in that area than I. Do you um, do that at the committee meeting? That is at the committee level. Yeah. It is? Yes. 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 But, uh, the, but the chair has to be uh, a board member. And has so to be a board it's, member. Right. Basically, it comes down to you two figuring out which is going to be one. So. Yeah. In that case, I agree with what we're going to say. Do you second the motion? I second the motion. Thank you. Is there any other comments that you guys want to make? Okay. Oh. Public comment on committee assignments. Great. Shall we? Just one quick question. Multi-agency body, the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency, 
uh, again, it doesn't show. Lois is actually the vice chair right. of that agency. Should, should that be shown here since it's a different, it's a JPA? That is established. The only thing the district can decide is who its representatives are and without the Okay, Director Ferris. Aye. President Swan. Yes. Director Fulz. Yes. Director Henry. Yes. Director Moran. Yes. If we're ready to move on to uh, utility billing policy item E, SB 998 compliance, the Director of Finance will. I wrote the memo only because of implementation questions, but this is something Yeah, so overall, some of our um, rules and regulations are due to be updated, have Senate bills out that are essentially requiring us to update them. Um, so the portion that we're looking at today is the utility billing policy, which essentially is pulling from multiple sections of the district's current rules and regulations, um, getting everything a little bit more streamlined in the same category where we feel it's most appropriate, and then getting us in compliance with SB 998, which is um, revolving around the requirements for discontinuing water service. So this is step so, Gina kind of gives the different options as to what. You want me to? Sure, if you want to <laughs> Yeah, so just on the implementation side, um, the proposal is to adopt um, the resolution, which explains the need for the policy that Stephanie prepared and attaches the policy as an exhibit. Um, and that's recommended for the reasons Stephanie indicated, but of course alternatives would include not uh, making, uh, not adopting the resolution and making the recommended changes, um, or I'm sorry, alternative number one would be to request changes to the proposed resolution or the policy, um, not recommended because of the hard work that um, Stephanie did to come up with a workable policy that complies with 998, um, or take no action, again not recommended because um, this policy will help us get into compliance with the new law by the time it takes effect in February. So the main changes, we're streamlining some of it. Um, some different areas that we've experienced as being a little bit more vague, like owner-tenant relationships, having all of that stuff very clearly stated um, were some of the other changes that went in. Some of them were just copy-paste over maybe a couple tweaks to the wordings. Most notably is the discontinuance of water service. This does get us in compliance with SB 998. Essentially, you cannot turn someone off until they are 60 days past due. Um, there's different requirements for if someone is 200% at the poverty level. A lot of different little things that could be very cumbersome. So what the district said is we've gone ahead and whatever that, that I guess, highest bar you would call it, that they're setting, like this is the most flexibility you need to give any of these people that hit this requirement, that's when we just went ahead and set it. So that way, people aren't having to sit here and prove to us that they are this or are that. It's kind of just making it an equal playing field for everyone. Um, it is requiring the district to offer after-hour turn-ons. Um, you have to do noti you know, a couple different ways of noticing if there's a different mailing address versus the site address. If you believe that there could be a tenant living there, there's different steps to, to that process as well. It's going to be a significant amount of increased work for the front office. Um, we're going to have this implemented by February 1st, and so that's where we're kind of wanting to make sure that the board is on board with this policy so that we can then officially move forward with updating our tags, updating the back message on our bill. There's a lot of different steps that go into go into this process. Um, another big one is we are proposing that there is, let me get to it, um, a small balance account 
Um, so any balance on a bill of $20 or less may be carried over to the next billing period. That's going to allow you know, someone that has a low balance on their account not to be getting dinged with a penalty. We do have some people that just round, you know, throw a hundred bucks and usually it ends up floating them through to the next bill. This would prevent any low balance accounts from, from hitting um, that amount. The other main thing is actually imposing a true late fee. Uh, we don't have an actual late fee. A lot of our customers, as it is now, you know, your bill gets presented, it's due 21 days later. Your next bill goes out. If there's a notice on that bill, if you don't pay by that bill's due date, you still then even have a lag time until we get to the point of physically going and hanging a tag at your door is when the first you know, payment penalty is getting applied, even though there's been a lot of legwork leading up to that point. The way that we structured the late fee to be is that you need, while it's still due 21 days from your bill's due date, we'll notify you just before that next bill is about to go out, you have to pay your balance of that previous bill before that next bill goes out. Otherwise, a $10 late fee will be applied to your bill. I've looked at what a lot of the other water districts have done. That seems, that's about the number that I came up with naturally from looking at the work that it takes to go into this. It also is what a lot of the other agencies have, either a $10 or a 10%. Most water bills for those agencies were around $100 is the average bill. So I mean, everyone's kind of around that $10 um, late fee penalty. The district does have to offer um, alternative payment arrangements that can be amortized out up to a year, uh, essentially more at the customer's discretion versus where we used to have a little bit more control over, you know, if they have a relatively good history, you know, oblige if someone habitually, you know, we kind of constricted a little bit. Um, this does kind of give <coughs> essentially a very clear description of how all of these different situations are being. I'm trying to think if there's anything. So we, we currently don't have a late fee. This would give us the opportunity to impose one. Yeah. And set a 60 day period for shut off. So what ends up happening now? What we do now. This changes what we do now. Yeah, it changes. So essentially your bill goes out, it has 21 days, your next bill goes out on a regular date, it has 21 days, and about a week after that, if you still haven't paid, which is about 45 days, you're getting a tag hung at your door. At that point, you're getting charged a penalty. Yeah, for the, it's for a the, it, is a, it is a tag penalty um, for the fact that we're physically having to send someone out. Um, the way that this new one will be is it's pushing it to where we can't even shut off your water until your bill is 60 days past due. So we're already into about the 85 day mark. I am not a fan of it. There was a lot of people opposed to this bill. For the small districts, it's a nightmare to allow your customers, these people are going to be having their fourth bill come out before their water is even potentially getting shut off for non -peak. So people that let it go have potential to have a lot of money racked up when it comes around time to their water actually being turned off. Um, we do have a lot of people that wait until their water's turned off to make a payment. I'm worried that they're going to now be at an unmanageable balance at it. Late fee should hopefully encourage people to pay it more on time. Mm -hmm. So, Stephanie, how, how many people do we do that to a year? Do you have an idea? We we have yeah. In my, in my monthly report that I do, I have the stats of how many okay. people we've turned off and how many um, tags we've done. We do about two hundred and forty two fifty tags per month, and cool. around thirty shutoffs per month. Which, which actually is pretty, when you think about it, it's pretty low. Yeah. I mean, 30 out of 8,000, roughly 8,000. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Not a lot. You know, obviously there will be a whole lot of grace periods giving, waving of that first initial fee. <coughs> There's going to be messaging going out with all of this. The nice part is, is we should have the website up by the time this stuff is, you know, we may choose to waive 
that initial late fee, that first month, and kick it out a little bit while we're still getting the messaging out. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping that we can have a really good PR push on it, public outreach, the new website. Is that in Christina Wise press banner? Should she be writing an article on this? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I. Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah. huge. Outreach. Yeah. Outreach. This is huge. Yeah. I mean, Scott, no. all of the agencies are reaching out to each other to find out how everyone's doing it exactly. You know, I mm -hmm. heeded Gina's advice to where wherever you could take direct wording out of the Senate bill is what you use as the wording in, in your document. Um, and so when it comes to this section, wherever that, what you know, wherever I was able to just straight up take the, the legal wording, you know, we did. Um, the last page of this does give, it might be hard to see on this, um, but it gives an example of a timeline for so we have, our customers are billed on the 20th or the 5th of each month but it shows those little blue balls in, in our each bill that goes out so that eight you know for the person that's getting their bill on january 20th isn't going to be shutting off getting shut off until uh what does it say april yeah. april 14th and they're about to have their april bill coming out to them so Actually, April 27th, when they actually get shut off. They get a notice before then, but the shut off is uh, the, after the March bill, right? This the, the March, that's when the March bill is due. So I think it ends up being uh, 414 is in this example where their actual water would oh, be. Oh, sorry, I'm looking at the bottom. Oh, sorry, yeah, 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 I'm at the top one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where it would be getting shut off. Right. I think what's going to happen is we're going to have a significant <laughs> number of people paying it. We're going to do our due diligence with the notification system. We're really going to push. We have a lot of people that are signed up for it. Most of them use that as their reminder. They don't want to be at risk of getting that, that tag penalty. I feel like a lot of them are going to use it to pay their bill before they even get the $10 penalty. Then the district has to do additional mailers and everything. If they still get to the point of a tag going out, they'll still incur that tag penalty. Um, we're going to keep those amounts the same, the $25 physical tag, the $40 discontinuance. Um, after our turnouts, if someone does, they are going to be required to sign something, you know, agree to us sending someone out um, and agree to come in that next business day and pay the after hours turn on fee if they're requesting that. Um, it is written to where if someone was turned off due to they moved into the home, something like that, that fee would be, that aspect of it would be paid. Um, I just find myself wondering how many bad debts we're going to wind up with that cannot be collected because of this. You know, they're just barely hanging in there, they don't pay their bill 84 days go or 85 days and yeah. they just say adios. We are, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to make the owner-tenant relationship much more specific in this policy to where the owner is ultimately responsible. It is a courtesy of the district to allow tenants to sign up for water service. You as the homeowner are still responsible to ensure that mm -hmm. that utility is, mm -hmm. is being paid. If a cus if is that normal? Really? Mm -hmm. There's some places that don't even allow tenant accounts. It has to be in them. We used to have Does that. PG and Brian that? changed it. Does PG no, because you know? no. PG and E will make it follow you, and PG and E will turn you off in the blink yeah. of a hat and not. Now, if they leave the PG service area, then yeah, they're yeah. probably screwed. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, that, that's a big service area. area. Yeah. We had this problem many years ago when the tenants would just move out and leave us with the bill. And then the district changed it to the owner was responsible. And the tenant could get a duplicate bill, but the owner was responsible and our bad debt went down considerably. And the previous district management changed the game back to allow the tenant to have more control. Big mistake. So the way that this is going to work is if you're getting further in this process, the owner is going to be notified that they have a tenant account that's delinquent. If a tenant account gets shut off for no, no uh, non-payment, it will immediately revert back to the owner's account. And that tenant won't be able to open an account on their own. So that should hopefully help with with that. It does because become very awkward right now. 
with the process as it as it is now. So most of these uh, late fees or turning off the water are tenant related, not necessarily. Oh no, I would I'd say I, we don't we don't currently track oh. how many are, are tenants or owners. Um, but part of this process is going to require us to notify. It's actually the reverse. If we think there's a tenant there, we have to notify the owner and attempt to make contact with the person there. So the, and they have the right. So now these other agencies that didn't allow tenants before, I believe they will have to now because it states that a tenant has the right to come in and establish water service in their name and pay the ongoing bills to keep the water service on. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting process. The background, I'm assuming, is made for more of the larger, you know, LA densely populated areas to prevent right. owners from abusing, you know, getting utilities shut off to try and force someone out. Or, you know, this has to be translated in a lot of different ways. It's making sure that there's plenty of time for whoever it is that's living there to get notice that their water is about to be turned off, have it translated in whatever language they speak so they can understand it and have a right to remedy it to keep their, their utility on. So I understand it from that perspective, but for a small agency like ours, it's a very difficult thing to establish. Do you have a question? Well, a question uh, and a comment. I'll comment first. It, we, we did go through this in the budget uh, committee um, and some pretty good detail and stuff did a good job of presenting it. It is very disappointing that the legislature saw fit to do a one-size-fits-all. It applies to big and small, and we we just didn't need this kind of. Uh, I think with the I think you had estimated with the addition of the overhead wall, we're going to be bumping up. It doesn't account for the whole thing. We're going to be bumping up to almost one full-time equivalent person that will will deal with this. No, that's it's multiple, multiple, people. Right, multiple yeah. people. Yeah, right. full time equivalent. Right. Now it's not like we're at zero now, but mm -hmm. this is pushing that uh, in terms of the direct cost to us um, mm -hmm. by a uh, sizable percentage. It's it's not it, it is a material thing. Um, so it you know fortunately our local representative voted against it, um, but you know probably got overruled by all the urban guys. Right? So. I, the question I had was about the word interim. So um, <coughs> she was very careful with her language. So uh, it is why interim? Because this um, <coughs> policy, the way we did it, um, really needs to be formalized via an ordinance and made part of the rules and regulations. <coughs> but the timeline for doing that wasn't yeah. very consistent with getting it rolled out for this meeting so that. Um, Stephanie and her staff could start implementing it before February 1st. So this is a little bit of, um, you know, Stephanie did such a great job on the policy that yes. we're able to just sort of implement it for now as written, but it needs to get merged with an update to the rules and regs. And I think there's a few different pieces that are in the works for that, and it sure would be nice to put all, to the extent we can, to put all those together with a single ordinance um, and go through the publication requirements for that once early next year. So this will come back. It'll come basically. back. Yeah, in a more, in a way, it'll take what Stephanie did and make it um, probably formalize a little and mesh it into the rules and Yeah, Darren has some meter stuff. Like, I mean, there's going to be probably three main, this being meter one of the view. three, one of the three main chunks of the master rules and regulations review. So this is kind of is one. So, I mean, if people have tiny word changes, maybe it, we could accept it, it tonight and tweak those. Yeah. Is, is it possible that based on our experiences, we may tweak it a little okay. bit <coughs> as well? I, I'm assuming that you know, no ballot plan survives contact, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say based on your experience, if you do feel we need to make changes, feel free to so bring it back to the board in that, in that ordinance. Yeah, and it's going to have to be when we put it into the rules and regs. I mean, it's just, there's going to be a certain aspect of making sure it works with the other provisions in yeah. the rules and regs that's going to end up creating some changes. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other discussion? 
Down on the track only. He said, the okay. loose bumps. Did, did Chuck raise his hand first? Yeah. First and last, and I'll call. Go ahead. <coughs> no, he no, did. He's not. No, he did. Um, I'm thinking of a proposed change, but I'm not sure this is the right place to put it. But let me just put it out there for thought. Um, bear with me. <laughs> One day I was let in by Joe, and I met Joe. And the next time I saw Joe, I said, how's it going? He said, not so good. And I said, why? Because it's Thursday. That's when he hangs the timers. And after he described the process, it's just... Because he has to say, we're going to turn off your water through the door, because they never answer the door. And he always gets the same response, this plaintive voice that says, please don't turn off my water. Now, the 3% of 240 users is one thing. And as you said, a lot of them pay up and they're back in service. But there's 30 that are chronic. And they go off and on and off and on. When they don't have water, they find the money to turn the water back on again. And he's there the next month turning it off again. And I'm just wondering, is there anything we can do for them? Scotts Valley's got a solution. They use part of their property tax to subsidize some of their ratepayers. It's a bad precedent. I understand that. But maybe there are certain cases where we can help. This does give a lot. They will receive multiple. That just makes it worse because longer. they have a bigger bill to pay. And time. I, I know. Yeah. It's, it, that's the hardest I'm just, part. Because it takes us time. I mean, Joe's got to go out and hang the tag, and he's got to go out and take the tag off. And, and you know, so we're spending money. We're really spending money yeah. for these people. Yeah, and so maybe a way to break this vicious cycle is to help some of these people. The same way Scott Spelman does with their property taxes. We can't use ratepayer money because it doesn't benefit all rate payers. But, but they seem to be getting away with it for well, some of their that would be, an, I mean, that would be another discussion that we, I have I, a stack of, that is one of the things that I have stuff to review on. I just got to throw it out there because it is costing I, us money is my point. I, we don't wanna, Aside from it being something that's hard to do. We don't want to encourage it to grow here. That's you know, another there's so many different sides yes. of this yes. issue that people have a tendency to take advantage of everything in this world and a complicated program. Right. So but I mean, that, that'll be a different discussion that we can have. I can... But we do get, isn't it, I, th I thought I saw it in the order of $700,000 a year from property taxes. That's a lot of money yeah. that we but, could use, I'm just saying. But, but it doesn't come from everybody in the district, is my point. I, I know. I utility billing policy doesn't really go into that. I mean, this is an item that I'm more than happy to have on a different agenda to be able to dive into well, further. Well, Margaret Bruce put this, brought this up in a, in a board meeting, I think, three years ago. Many times. And I was adamantly against it. That I meant Joe. Against what? Against what? Adam, adamantly against um, doing what I'm proposing doing right now. Oh. Of course, in Felton, you don't pay any property tax to, your, to the district. It, that is a good discussion for another time. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can we put yeah. that on the agenda? Yes, well, that's our the time. Yeah. Um, it would be great if the state would um, institute something like lifeline billing for um, water. I think that would have to be for a constitutional amendment, though. Um, it, we have it for power, we have it for a telephone, but for whatever reason, we don't have it for the most critical part of life. Right. And it, 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 it astounds me that the legislature has not proposed uh, something like that to deal with this. I, I, I'm just, I'm beside myself about it. So, and, um, so yeah, you know, just to, to wrap up this and be able to make a motion on this thing, I had one question or comment. And maybe you've seen it done elsewhere, but I ran across something recently that seemed to have a lot of uh, potential to address types of situations you're referring to, which is what if you gave all of the, uh, the customers, right, all the ratepayers, 
the opportunity to, whatever the difference is on their bill, right? Let's say their bill is, is $100.30. Right? What if we were to round, give them the opportunity to opt into a program that rounds up their bill to $101, and that $0.70 stays with us in a special fund that can be used to offset mitigating circumstances for people in this type of situation you're referring to. I mean, if we went out and gave the citizens of the, the, the water board, I mean, the customers of the water board, the opportunity, do you want to participate in a program that's going to help your neighbors, friends, whatever, it's, uh, we might have some administrative costs, right? But other than that, it would be, it would be everybody, the entire pool of customers participating. That's essentially the program that one of the programs that Marjorie Bruce is looking at. We yeah, look at like three years DJ ago. has the you know, issue. one dollar. You know, the issue you run they also have a department the that runs. We need to find somebody. There's, there's one thing would be two things. Well, one would be to generate the money and then have another organization administer who gets yeah, so it. Exactly. I mean, the issue is you've got, um, yeah. if you do just a roundup, your average roundup, let's say, is going to be, um, I have, we have to look at the bills, but let's just say it's 50 cents for. Yeah. Purposes of argument, that's four thousand uh, dollars a month. If a hundred percent of people did it, you're, and then you've got administrative costs. We're not at a scale. Right. This thing works a lot better when you have a scale, either multi-utility, like uh, there are some places where that, that provide sewer, water, uh, electric, etc., and so your bills are bigger, or you have a lot more subscribers. We are a small district, and if we got a twenty-five percent take rate, you're looking at thousand um, bucks. I get that that might help some number of people, but from an administrative cost point of view and all the other things that we have to do, uh, you know, we talked about this actually in the budget. Yeah. Well, I think maybe time. the budget, maybe we'll keep it a pretty broad subject, not just property tax, but we'll, maybe we can just make it being alternatives to be able to look at some of that, because that is one of the ones that we looked into and the places that did participate you're talking about large cities, Very counties, large cities. It would, it, and that's exactly what I heard from them yeah. is, oh, you're only that, they're like, yeah. that's no Yeah, it's unfortunate, it's an unfortunate situation. Okay. So if someone's happy with this document, um, I'd love a motion. Yes, yeah, so, so we're talking about Resolution 16, uh, 15. I move that we adopt uh, San Juan's Valley Water District Resolution Number 15-19-20, uh, Interim Utility Billing Policy. Second. We have a second. Paul. All right. right. Director Ferris. Aye. President Swan. Yes. Director Pulse. Yes. Director Henry. Yes. Director Moran. Yes. Motion passes. We're ready to move on to, into item F, uh, rates and charges. I'm not sure if it's Gina or this Stephanie going to take this, this one. Too. Yeah, it was a, it was a, joint, a joint effort. Okay. Um, so as a separate item, the board adopts the rates and charges of the district by resolution. There are some changes from that utility billing policy that we would like to adopt. This also is what was vetted by the budget and finance. We are proposing um, the $10 late fee an after hour turn on fee of $100, which should cover the staff person's two hour minimum of going out. Um, and the third item surplus. is a surplus commercial deposit. So right now, the bulk water station over there that we have follows the same general $75 deposit that all of our customers have. The problem we run into in the summer is we have bulk users that are using it for commercial use that in one fill up are obviously blowing through that $75 and we have had problems in the past collecting. So the policy and this deposit is geared towards the people that are using it for personal use under 10 units per month stay at the same $75 deposit that they've had. The people that are using it for commercial or exceeding that, that 10 unit per month use have to hold a $500 deposit to help ensure that the district essentially isn't getting, you know, shorted on it. Because unlike a, a personal home, we don't really have a way of going after 
the surplus person other than saying, sorry, you can't fill up here anymore, and they're simply going, ha, 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 I did that to the last five water districts that I filled up then. I mean, I don't know. <coughs> so those are the three things, relatively simple. Um, the tag fee and the, the regular turn-on fee, we're keeping the same. We feel that this late fee should generate the proper amount of income to cover this process. Um, we did agree that a six to nine month period, so towards the end of next year, okay. we will reevaluate to see what's going on exactly if that fee still, fee still feels appropriate. Our intention is to cover what it's costing the district, not you know more, more or less. Sorry, I had a little attack here. Sorry. No, no, no. Forcing the blood. Her cancer. I'm just so, if anyone has any questions on that, otherwise, it extra, kind of goes hand in hand with the other item. The extra administration, administrative cost of doing both of these together, is that what you estimated to be another full time person? Well, no, it's not another full time person. We're going to go, this is Stephanie's estimate, not mine. She said that with all of this stuff around 998, we're going to be right at about one full time equivalent person. And by equivalent, that means there's lots of different people that do things. You aggregate them all together. It's a one. Now, that doesn't mean we're going from zero to one full time. We're already doing some of this around uh, late. And did you estimate it was about a half a person or 60%? It was about two thirds. So two-thirds. we're estimating yeah. this is going to generate an so additional another, third. Another third. So I'm estimating the past due charges and fees to be coming in somewhere around 100 to $125,000. So does this mean you're going to be under the gun as soon as we pass this? Uh, we have these to be implemented um, February 1st. Okay, so you yes. have a couple months. Correct. It'll all go in, I mean, all of this is geared around the the new utility billing policy, so they all will go hand in hand in February 1st. Are you worried at all about your ability to do your job after February 1st? Well, I don't want to worry for you. Just tell, tell me now and I'll, I'll shut up. There'll be a peak. I would say my staff is very good at adapting and we'll get our jobs done. Okay. I'd say look at the minutes of, minute of telephone calls for yes. that. It'll be, I mean, yes. it'll be, I mean, like hard. any new thing, we're going to have a flood in the beginning and then people understand it and it'll... So you'll prepare it'll for it deal yes. with it. it. Then they'll fall back to, you know, a normal cadence. So we're looking for, for a motion for a resolution 16 19 19-20. I move that we pass resolution 16 1920. Audience. Check anything. Well, I do a second. We can still do a second. Do we have a second? Yeah. I have a second. Good. 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 Director Henry? Yes. And Director Moran? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, uh, I'm 11 G. Um, as you know, the district's in the process of launching a, a new website. Uh, through this process, it's been recommended that be now would be a, a great time to review uh, a desire to change the district logo. Um, staff went out and got a consultant to help us design a local consultant that gave us a, a pretty good price as he wanted to get established in the San Lorenzo Valley. Uh, staff has reviewed several designs and we have came up with the uh, presentation that Stephanie will be giving you very shortly. And we hope tonight we can pick a new logo because now we need this to move ahead on the website. I don't want to slow up on the yeah. website. So, how much for it? Uh, what was it, say, nine? $900. Nine hundred dollars. Yeah. He is doing. Well, he wants to establish in the center. He of the works over the hill constantly. This he lives yeah. in. You know, he's local in Ben Lomond. It. This was a more so pro bono. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Doing a great job. Yes. So if you'll turn to the screen, the presentation. Yeah, so so he kind of helped, us, helped guide us with. You know, the colors are shown or just suggestions. You know, he can tweak that. Um, one of his big things was, you know, a logo should be strong enough to work in black and white as well. Uh, a logo rarely sits alone. It's usually on a piece of collateral apparel or a vehicle. So consider the marks versatility rather than how it looks by itself on the middle of kind of um, these pieces of paper. 
Um, he came up with some initial ideas. Uh, from that, we had you know staff put their input on which ones they liked. That then drilled him down to be able to focus on some of the, the further concepts. Um, so this was one of his original ones. Um, a dual drop, the blue obviously representing water, the green representing more of you know the, environment. the environment. No more brown. No more brown. Um, uh, and a nice uh, big redwood tree. So from this initial one, which still followed through as one of his recommended ones, he incorporated some of the other things that people liked where they're like, well, what about some mountains, some different stuff. And so he's gone through and given good iterations of some of the applications um, for how they could be applied. You know, some of the wording you'll see change on some of them. And so it's kind of gone through. You all should have gotten emailed where it kind of is showing you on the front page all of them. So that makes it a little bit easier to help, you know, have your eye gravitate towards ones, ones that you like. Um, so like you said, it's important to kind of look at the color versus just the black and white and how, how it can be applied to everything. And then from our past meetings that we've had, you know, community meetings and so forth, you know, the public has, has expressed wanting to have redwood trees, wanting to have the stream, and possibly mm -hmm. mountains in our logo. Um, well, make it look more like yeah, more like the San Lorenzo Valley, and so that's what we tried to do here. A, a cowboy country. Exactly. So all of these different variations came in more last night. So every all of the staff that had their original input haven't necessarily had a chance to see all of them. This is then migrating into one of the other the other styles. It's a little bit more of an organic, you know. River and drawing. What is that like? No cognitive bias. No, just kidding. I, I don't know if the field staff has looked at those shirts and that would be a design if they wanted that big of a logo on the front of the shirt. Oh, yeah. We, I mean, we haven't got that far yet. Yeah. It yeah. wouldn't all be like that. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to make sure that that logo will still be small. Yeah, it would be small like that. I just want to make sure that we um, talk about that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I go for a more simplistic, easily branded type of thing. I personally like D1. The two drops? <clears throat> the you two know, it doesn't translate. The color I like better than black and white. It looks it's pretty good in grayscale. The grayscale, I, <laughs> think look, I like it in grayscale. <laughs> that was one of them that I cared that. Yeah. The grayscale I liked. Oh. So, you know, if we were to use a black and white, I would use that that as the version. Um, but everyone has different opinions on all of this stuff. So, you know, it's kind of, you know, one of the main things he's, he was, you know, he's like, well, how do you want to stand out differently? You know, most water districts do have some sort of water element, or do you want people to be able to easily identify what their business is? And so, in my mind at least, I think it's important that, our, you know, right now our trucks get confused a lot with the counties. You know, there's cable this, TV. We yeah, I mean, you know, white truck. They're all white trucks. Or white SW trucks more. with these little, you know, ours is square, but the counties is round. But for the most part, it's the same colors. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I like the idea of something being easily identified. So personally, I like this one, and the other ones get too busy for me. But and again, if you're asking for my opinion, that one. And then this one with color, before he just had drawn it out without really having the color Please. element. Please. I didn't see that on the is that, is that yours, James? That's yeah, I, kinda, I like the way the San Lorenzo went. Well, you know, here you're going to still have to oh, probably yeah. read the name to know what it yeah. is. Um, I kind of really determine the difference between one and two. Not a lot. That's the river, right? That's the river. Yeah, yeah the river looks too much. Looks like, like the tree's a little different. Yeah, no, the tree doesn't work well. Maybe it's the color. Oh, should be a little oil. You would have followed the recommendation yeah. staff. <laughs> no, I, I'm going to follow the recommendation. But it's not just anything. It was when we did the original D1 was the one that had 
the majority of the likes. This one is the one that came in second. So, I mean, that's where he put his focus. Did anyone ask the question, what's the significance of the two drops? I mean, that's the first thing I ask, why two drops? I mean, I know one of them is to put it in a silhouette of a tree in, but still. Silhouette of the tree and the blue and the green. What's the color? Representing that, it's, you know, it's, it's water, the water trees, and it's, you know, yeah. the environment. Well, this one's pretty good. This E1, the way they're going to wear Two drops. Yeah, so I, hate, I, hate, I hate to bring this up, but changing the logo is of a public agency is a, is a big thing. Emotional. Um, uh, I think we'll probably get a lot of agreement in the community that we need a new logo. But to what extent do we want to consider um, community um, input, comments, whatever, into into uh, a new logo. I mean, to me, this was their opportunity tonight. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I, I mean, it is it is late. It is it is late in the day, and you know, and just as the mission statement um, evokes a lot of um, comments, um, it's possible we may get that here too. Could, well, well, maybe stuck it, around for the item. Right? <laughs> if you, I mean, if the you website. Do. I mean, it, it's one of those things where. You're going to have so many different yeah. opinions coming in. That if you wanted to go back one more time to the public, I kind of recommend that maybe we get it down to just two or three to give them a choice. Yeah. Try, let's try to keep narrowing the amount down to our top two or three. And uh, because this color stuff and my goodness. But then how are you going to do it? Are you going to do a public poll? Or are we going to do public outreach around it? Is it just going to be the people that well, choose to come to that well, meeting? We, we, they could do it very quickly. Yeah. Um, they, the, if you do it very quickly, emails out to the people we have email address yeah. addresses to. Yeah. I don't think we can do that for notifications, yeah. right? Because we don't solicit on them. We have an email or e-newsletter. Yeah. And, and also agendas. And, I mean, so there's probably enough emails you can get. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe not statistically significant, but enough input. I, I think, Rick, you're right. You don't want to give you know, a whole... No, but we're trying to get it down, trying to get you just a handful. Yeah. But, but I, I think asking the question, um, I think we should... I mean, my opinion is that we, we should consider doing that. Because um, it is... I mean, this is starkly different from the current um, logo. But they're soothing, and they're not... Just they're good. How soon do you need a decision on this? We'd like to get it as soon as possible because we're trying to get the the website done and we will transition it in slowly to all of our other business cars and yeah. trucks and Re renewals. And yeah, renewals. as it time comes up as we order a new stationery or do this or do that. But we'd like to get this as soon as possible. So I wouldn't want to go Stephanie, do you have any if you have things going more than a month? Or was that too long? I mean, I could, we could put together an e-newsletter and solicit it, people's... You, can you do, could you do a survey monkey or something like that inside of the uh, email list that we have? And yeah. people just to, one, you know, just easy thing, click one, two, three, or, you know, what if, something like that. Um, you can put it on the website? No, no, I, you can do a survey monkey that's independent of... Um, yeah. Of the website. And We've that, done survey monkey before. Yeah, and that would give you the ability to very quickly gather at least some number of, of, of feedback. Why don't we help narrow it down to three? Yes, that is what Rick was suggesting. Uh -huh. I think that makes perfect sense. I love Stephanie's choice, number one. <laughs> number one's in. Number one's in. And, well, and then change that number. And, number. and what about this one? Well, this doesn't, and this doesn't include the others. And then no. uh, there's... That was number two. I wish it had been on the third. Yeah. Stephanie, number six on the, the first thing. Oh. Number six. So, yeah, there's a couple there that we look at and people want to go across there. What is the significance of that sideways as it looks like a Mobius strip? It's a river. That's the river. It's like a river. That, okay, so it, so you got the tree, you got a drop of water, and you got the river, which to me almost signifies environmental. It's like bringing everything together. There's no mountain. No, but it's you know I like the mountains. Water, tree, environment. The mountains are nice. We we specifically discussed how we didn't want to make Sweet. them too. 
to Tahoe-ish because we don't want people misconstruing that we are not a snowpack or a right. snow. Right. right. But I think including mountain and stream is, is uh, or hill, whatever you want to call it, uh, and stream would be a really good thing. I like the sideways S. I, like, I, like, I don't know why that just... Which one is that again? Well, number eight has Two, it, number nine six. has it, six. Yeah, I'd say the three, eight, nine, I like. I mean, I'd say I'd be probably three, torn eight, between nine. three or eight. I like eight. Three, eight. Yeah. I would go one, <laughs> eight, 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 and E. One, eight, and E. There you go. Only has better style sense, probably, than all the rest of us put together. So. Yeah, I, uh, I think we should pick probably two from this one and then have that, one from that the other one. alternative. The one I mean, kind one of more is the other one. I mean, I, I like eight. One is more of You're the only person. <laughs> well, no, I, I agree with James. I, I, think it's I love one. Uh, doesn't do no, well, if you like eight, what about nine? Now you, get, you lose the tree in eight. You don't like eight better than nine. So you got to run a scale. Yeah, I like eight better than nine. You got to have the tree. Yeah, I like those yeah, better. better. Do we have do we have eight in grayscale? Somewhere. Uh, I take your chair? Yes, you'd have eight. You reclaim the earth. Well, I thought you were going over there to sit. This would be the hardest one to get fixed into the sun. Gina, what do you think? Eight in grayscale, unfortunately, doesn't work. Oh, that doesn't work at all. It's too good. I mean, it gets busy, is the hard part. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. That's where, would, where would you use grayscale? A lot. All the time. time. Yeah. That's on paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the T-shirt. I'll say T-shirt when you. It's awful big. We don't want uh, that big below. Okay, so eight's out. One out. Was your T-shirt? Eight is out. Oh my. Three was another similar. Yeah, three's pretty good. But there's no river. Well, it's just no a river. Ma 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 what did he Mark say when he? I mean, did he have a favorite one? Yeah, the design is about four. One, three, eight, and nine. Which are one, three, eight, what, three, nine? three, eight, and nine are all he had lumped together as a similar yeah, no. style. He's like, but he's like, it's a very creative design. But the problem um, he did is where the one was his other. Where the drops overlap, it doesn't work on grayscale. It doesn't look like it. at least the eight didn't work. And that right. the place that didn't work for me in, in grayscale was the overlap. Right. But it looks good here on this one, where it's not two drops. One is a that that is true. Which is E? Is that a but w we can go to e. Let's go to e. Oh, there really is E. That's the round one. That's the one that's got the water oozing out of the river. Where's E? Well, he actually showed us how he did this, and he just went and just kind of which one threw it e? on the paper. That is These so ones are it's e. a very oh, organic oh, shape. So they were they were oh, color variants. We have it on the truck, and the shirt this doesn't look like a ripper. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it does. It looks like somebody's tongue is, uh, you know. Coming out there. Grateful Dead to Chinese calligraphy. I mean, that, I, if he could do it's something like about it, maybe, maybe if he handed it right at the circle instead of having it hanging out yeah. of the circle. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's that it gets bigger. It starts looking like a tongue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's I don't coming at you. And I can give him, I mean, he can turn around I mean, see, and this with, like, tweak three these. trees. If it's we have it narrowed down stretch. to a couple and we have specific yeah. things that we want him to, to mm -hmm. modify it. He can do that, and then those can be the ones that we that we send out. But there's just no, there's no like hill. There's no hills in here, though. Right. We can modify so, so the hill. It, what What do you like about? Can we Can we go with what what we don't want? Like what do you like about? There you go. Yeah. Simple, and it's more. I like it. Yeah, it's it's my staff looked yes. at it. My staff liked it. Like which one? It's more, country, it's more country. I mean, we had we had opinions about putting three trees in there instead of just one, and maybe a hill. Just you know, add to it a little bit. And I agree, the tongue hanging out the end of it is. We kind of talked about that too. But if you cut it off, I mean, it narrower coming down. It, it, is the issue with the other ones that they're too water droppy out, out there? They're too water droppy. Sort of avant garde. Everybody else, go forward. everybody else has water drops. We don't want water shot. Well, you know, I looked at Soquel Creek, and they actually have the yin and yang. Um, it's not really 
Well, I can't even figure out what's so Scotts Valley. Yeah, so or what the hell that yeah, is. Yeah, that's that's right. a picture, isn't it? I mean, they just kind of took a picture. Yeah. Scotts Valley? Yeah. I like yeah. how yeah. the river. Too busy. I do. I mean, I think it's a good thing, but there's no, no hill. I mean, President Swan, get this in order here. Stand <laughs> clock. <laughs> oh, three. I picked pick one, which is one. I, I like that. I would submit that as one of the three. Somebody else take a positive, serious position. Could you go on back to the one other one, so we can have two, four, four. <coughs> Bob, you you love four. Does, does it have an E or a D or whatever? There's no green. In four. Well, so if if, yeah. if we okay. shorten the tongue on E, that's not a E two or E one. Or they're both no, the no, same. No, yeah, they're same. Even the truck's giving up on this. Yeah, you got to hang around with the rest of us. So, <laughs> so basically, what you're I was told to vote for nine. nine. My duty is nine. nine. I'm going this home. one is nine. more similar yeah. to our existing logo, and therefore be more comfortable. Which one? No. Ease. Yeah. Nice. Nothing. Which one? E. Nothing's well, like no, that. No, no, no. It's yeah. Not, yeah. I see. No, no. Is a much more. It's it's more. So um, it's more country. It's yeah. more country. Yeah. small town. It, it yeah. is not. The drops are avant garde. They're definitely sort of a modernist approach yeah. to, to the logo making. It's a very different look. Yeah. It's, it is a starkly different look. Well, well, we like, should probably throw one of each out there. I agree that we should probably one or one, one of each one. out there. I like yeah. the. I still vote for six. six. I like that. I'm going for the E one or two. Oh, six. E two. Yeah. E two. Like we're, we're trying to get it down to three, though. That's you know, you've got to read something out. What, what do you have, Steve? A one. Yeah. One is on there. One is on there. Okay. And, and Bob and has e. four. And let's go E two then. Yeah, yeah. I like E two. From the staff. E two. E two. E two. And then throw those three on all the rest of the game. I'm sorry, I'm making this up. So take the tongue off, E2, boa constrictor, whatever. What's the third one? We got one, we got E2. E2. One and E2, and what's the other one? Oh, Bob likes four. Bob likes four. Okay, let's just call it those. Who likes six? Okay, let's call it those. Just throw those fours on there. Four is has an S as well. Who's on? Bob's on. Mine. So one, four, six, and E2. Okay, we get it. All right, and we'll do a survey. Well, did Rick Moran not get to see? I'm following the recommendation of the staff. There you go. And that's E2. <laughs> E2. Wait, well, so me too. I have one, D1, I have E2. What is the third? I heard four. six and four. We're going to do four. 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 Okay. Yeah. One, four, six, and E2. Okay. Oh, was it six? Yes. Oh, that's good enough. Put that back. Put back. We got four. Any modifications required for these ones? Everyone likes those ones as is. E2, we're going to go ahead and shorten ask you to shorten the tongue. And add a hill. Yeah. Before you send it out, we're going to shorten the tongue. Hoorah. 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 Okay. Hoorah. All right. Great. Okay, we don't need a motion or anything, so we're going to move on that. James, we don't, we don't want your guys to be uncomfortable. Okay. Um, I mean, I can, you're going to have a split within the district, even. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Let's see. Right? It's going to end up being. So we well, can do an in house survey. Did the. Uh, did oh, the they should, I mean, all, all in house should be voted for as well. Absolutely. So did the, did the did, office did staff have one or the field staff I'll, I'll like move. you two? Uh -huh. How did I know that? Gee, what a guess. Uh, all right. Okay, if we can get. Jimmy, you have something? Yeah, thank you guys. Personal rules and regulations? Yeah, yes. I'd like to take these. Three items will actually be very quick. Um, the only reason they came off the consent agenda, these are brought to you, and I, so I'm going to kind of consolidate my comments about all three of the next uh, agenda items. Um, these show up on the agenda every year because SDRMA provides incentives for the district to have these policies and to uh, re up them every year. I was given these a couple weeks ago with a request for legal review. I sent them to our employment department. The employment department flagged a number of issues that require a little bit of closer attention. They sent me a couple of new policies and said, here, you know, look at these. These are consistent with various legal requirements pertaining to um, sexual harassment and discrimination, disability, pregnancy, background checks, and so on. Um, 
there was no way I was going to be able to take what they gave me and turn it into something that makes sense and works for the district's other policies and the time allowed. So what I've done here is um, th these are just the same old policies that are coming uh, back to you to reapprove for the following year so that we can get the SDRMA um, incentive uh, take advantage of the SDRMA incentives, but with a note, I want you to be aware that all of these policies need to be updated to be um, uh, made current with uh, regulations and laws related to employment and anti-harassment and uh, disability leave and so on. So we're going to be doing that, and I hope to have them back to you for um, an early agenda in January. I'll leave it to... I'll work with you and the board chair on getting these back as early as possible. Okay. So, can we make one motion to well, there all three of those, or do we have to make one for each? It would be better, that because they're separate items with separate resolutions, it would be better to have a resolution or a motion okay. for each one. Okay. Well, we don't have public here, so I'll make a motion that we adopt... Uh, San Jose Valley Water District Resolution Number 11, 19-20, Personnel System Rules and Regulations 2019. I'll second it. Should that be 2020? I'm sorry. It's this? No, no, on the title. Sorry. You've got Personnel System Rules and Regulations 2019, and yet on the next one, we've got 2020. 2020. Yes. It, no, that's because it says... Uh, the, it was first adopted in on um, something 2020, right? You know, this oh, oh, you're right. You're right. You should say 2020. So let me just restate that. Uh, we, we adopt San Ramon Valley Water District Resolution Number 11, 19-20, Personnel System Rules and Regulations, Strike 2019, Add 2020. Do we have a second? I second. Director Ferris? Aye. President Swan? Yes. Director Coles? Yes. Director Henry? Aye. Director Moran? Yes. So the same, exactly the same explanation um, applies to 11 uh, I and J. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Make a motion? Yeah, go ahead. I move that we adopt San Lorenzo Valley Water District Resolution Number 12, 19-20, San Lorenzo Valley Water District Sexual Harassment Policy 2020. I'll second the motion. Director Ferris? Aye. Dire President Swan? Yes. Director Pulse? Yes. Director Henry? Yes. Director Moran? Yes. And um, the same explanation applies to 11J uh, and resolution number 10, 1920. I move that we adopt San Lorenzo Valley Water District Resolution number 10, 19 20, Respectful Workplace Policy 2020. A comment. <coughs> um, I'm looking for it, I don't see it now, but I thought somewhere in this one it talked about who needs training on this. And it, and it specifically addressed supervisory people on staff, right? Yeah, I think you know. I don't know that this policy, though, I think that is a requirement. I don't know if this policy. I thought it was in there somewhere when I went through it. Anyway, mm -hmm. if it is, yeah. <clears throat> um, do we want to, ex we're excluding the board members because the board policy manual addresses respectful workplace behavior, right? That's why we're drawing that distinction. Yeah. Oh, right. Well, this is, I think all this plays into the updates that need to be made yeah. because um, that training requirement is, has been changed with uh, new laws as of this year and we need to make sure that everything is consistent with that. I, I don't remember off the top of my head if board members are covered, but I sort of think they are by the new the new one. And they pushed the date out. They pushed the date out later for it. Twenty twenty one now. Yeah, I believe so. To where it's not just supervisory. Supervisors has two hours. Mm -hmm. All staff have a one hour. I don't know yeah. where board members fall into that. 
Yeah. That, well, that's what I was, I'm wondering. Are we excluding board members because there's a different policy for them for that, or, or did we just forget it? Can or we, or is it something we don't want to deal with? Can we answer that in the update? Yes, and I think it's okay. a good question. And I, I don't want to make it, I'm not inclined to make it a requirement if the law doesn't say that it should be, but if there's different perspectives on that, I'm happy to consider it. Because yeah. it does draw a distinction between board, board of directors, employees, and supervisors. So, I, you know, it does look at us differently. Yeah. So well, I, I, I just asked the question. Frankly, the respectful workplace policy of all of these is a little bit of an odd animal because it sort of touches on some legally prohibited, or some areas that are fairly heavily regulated um, under California law, but it mixes it with a number of things that the district has adopted that aren't really based on any particular legal requirement. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure what shape the policies should take in order to make them conform more closely with current law until I take a closer look. But, um, okay. There may be a need to sort of separate out some of the sexual harassment items and training related to that from the respectful workplace. Don't so worry about it now, Lou. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, okay. there's too many moving pieces for me to deal with it in the time. Uh, what we do need to pass it does. Have yeah. you made the motion, Bob? Yes. Um, Lou, would you care to second it? I will second the motion. <laughs> okay. Director Ferris? Aye. President Swan? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. Director Henry? Yes. Director Moran? Yes. Okay, we're ready to move on to consent agenda. Item 12. this, if nobody requests to pull an item um, from the agenda, uh, uh, well, under California law, they'll be considered um, approved with, uh, if there's, if nobody pulls one from the agenda, they can be approved without any discussion. Um, alternatively, one of the board members could request to have an item pulled for <coughs> a specific discussion. Um, on our agenda, and according to the board policy manual, the board does vote on these items. So I have, I have typically advised that a vote is not required because it's not under California law, but our board policy manual does call for a vote on the consent agenda items. I move that we adopt the consent agenda. Second. Director Ferris? Aye. President Swan? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. Director Henry? Yes. Director Moran. Yes. Okay, under the district reports, you have the department status reports for the, the four departments, engineering, finance, and business, legal, and operations. All the department heads are here. We'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Over 400 hours. Didn't you just say it was down? <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't have said it. And what fire would you know what those are all accounted to? <laughs> Is there any reason to believe we can charge people? We're, we're going to have that on the agenda when Stephanie's Steph putting together the finance. We did plan. get a $16,000 credit for the yeah. yeah. They gave all businesses a $250 credit, and since we're considered a business, every single one of our like 60 accounts got. Not even close enough to so no. pay for it. Okay. We'll, we'll have a report shortly on our full expenses. I think we discussed $9,000 in fuel. I mean, if, if nothing else, we need to make it visible and transparent. I mean, this is just absolutely ridiculous. We will have that report coming up, and we can, we can do a, an outreach piece of what this costed and what we did uh, to keep our folks in water. Um, mm -hmm. We had a very successful program and response, yeah. but it took around the clock full staff out uh, 24 7 to do it. We also identified some areas that we need to try to figure out how we can improve on our communications. Our complete SCADA system went down, the majority of it, not because we lost power, it's because Comcast and our you know, providers lost power. 
So we need to, to look into some type of alternative or backup system for scaling. I'm not sure it's possible, but we need to review it and look into it. It's possible. It's possible, it's but I don't know what it's covered. Yeah. I mean, you can get a... Yeah, uh, that's the way you can yeah, afford afford it. I'm not sure we can afford it. That's the second part of all this. <coughs> 90 bucks a month. Is it? I think Maybe they don't have a business, but it's, a, it's about that. I noticed some good news in here. Unless I missed, a, missed something, we've got a, well, we've, we've still got two more weeks to go, but we've got a whole year without overdrafting Fall Creek. They were all yeses. There was no no's in any week for a whole year. We, we've not done that before, did, right? Did, did we meet all of the requirements for Fall yeah. Creek? Yeah, yeah, yeah. all of them. Yeah. Right. The way you're... Yeah. Yeah. And it's good, it's good it to note, anyway. note that because sometimes people feel that we're a constant violation. Yeah. And we're yeah. not. But still, we need to correct. And where's Bruce when you want to be here? Well, Bruce would basically say, dudes, you've got a lot of work to do. Go figure it yeah. out. Santa Cruz is doing their thing. Go figure it out. Well, I mean, Ricker, we weren't even close. I'm John sure. Ricker even dug into it more. And yeah, we're finding more, more things to it that yeah. are. More and we'll be working with legal counsel and, and looking into our water rights. But seriously, is it were we were we just lucky, or did, did we do something right? I would like to think. It's the weather. Just the weather. Just the amount of water in the mountain, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the amount of water in the streams. Okay. I mean, uh, I'd like to think it was something. It's good saturation. So I know it is. We'll take credit if you want. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we have our work to do. When's the opening ceremony of probation tank? We haven't scheduled it yet, but soon. We do our walkthrough tomorrow, a final tomorrow on the walkthrough, and we will discuss that. Sutton will be there, press banner. Everybody will be there. I just had a discussion today on planning on it, so this huge we're moving ahead on planning. Should we invite, I mean, we should invite Scotts Valley City Council. Oh, we'll invite her, Yeah. So it'll be a big dog in the show. Yes. You will be. Anything else with the reports? Anybody? Any red flags going on anywhere? Yeah. No? No? Yes. So, um, the bill pay, I assume that it again is a bunch of construction, why it's like a million dollars. Does it have anything to do with the power outages, too? Uh, yeah, it has some to do with power outage, but it's mainly there was some massive probation. I mean, that project. Yeah got going and we were getting half a million dollar bills. Okay. Multiple half a million dollars. That's what I thought. But I Hopefully don't always think right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's in service. We are getting beneficial use in service and we'll be closing that project out soon. Anything else? Or can we wrap this up? Um, and you, your, your last um, your last day, your community reports, and you have written communications, which most of you have seen the several letters that you received from yeah. Yeah. customers. It's up to you what level of detail you want to go with through committee reports. Uh, I don't want to go into any detail. I want to get out of here. <laughs> Anybody from any committee have anything that's really s important to share with us right now? I got a question. On the customer complaint log, there was a hose bin that was knocked off, and there was a bad smell coming out of the faucet. <clears throat> the investigating operator collected a biological sample, and there's no, no indication of what the test results were for that sample. How would we... It should be in there. I, I don't think the sample came out on that before... So that'll be reported next month? It'll be, and it'll be back on the okay. report. As follow-up information, yes. Yeah, and just one item. I think it's been a little less than a year, so probably about a year. But it, we, by the time the new website gets up, it'll be just about a year since we started. I think that's like super fast and good work on the part of your team, Stephanie, for driving that through to completion. I know we had a lot of help from the uh, company Civic Plus, right? But the content and all the rest of it, you guys had to have done a great job on making forward to seeing them. Um, this is going to be a major change for the, for the district. Is there, is there a prototype of the 
this subway? She, she can. <coughs> There's still a lot of work to do. Yeah, we're going to do that the last afternoon. It's the transfer of the, the transfer of the data and to do it properly. It's yeah. a lot but, of work. Yeah. I mean, to get to where we are now in less than a year is just um, unbelievable. And I think it's due to the fact that we all know we need to get that website yeah. changed. Yeah, we're going to be training next week. Monday. Well, yeah. Okay. Did everybody read the agenda for the environmental committee next week? I did. <laughs> there was an attachment that, I, that, that surprised me. That means From me. From me? Well, you asked, or no, uh, Rick asked for that. Well, I, really? yeah. well it was brought up in uh, the gentleman who interested citizens talked about it, and he brought up Bill 5, well, and so forth. And then Rick but it was the state that required the testing. That made right, but then. This guy asked about it, and then Rick asked for a report, and I asked okay. Nate to prepare it. And for what? <clears throat> it is also key. PFOS? Yeah. Yeah. It is also the subject of a film that's out now called Dark Water. So that's uh, nice. people are seeing Are you happy with the memo? Or? Well, it, I mean, I think it's going to generate a lot more questions than because it, it, it kind of alludes to the fact that we might have a problem. When you're testing it, the parts per trillion level. I love Nate's analogy. He says it's like detecting one grain of sand in a, an Olympic swimming pool full of sand. You know, we did a Facebook post on it when all of the articles started coming out, and there was, I mean, well, no that's nasty stuff. Anything. That is nasty, nasty stuff. But the like parts per trillion, yeah, no, I know. You know, it's not an issue. But I, I think people are going to. Well, I think we're on top of it. Nate okay. does well, I just wanted to just like, did a great job of responding. Make sure you read the attachment to that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just. Because I asked James to make sure that Nate was there at the meeting next week. My concern is just that it, oh, I think no? this pertains to an upcoming yeah, agenda. Yeah, it's not on the agenda. Yeah. Okay. As opposed to like a report from yeah. the. We'll talk about it. Never mind. My eyes are getting there. If we added an agenda item to talk about other agenda items, then that Anything else on this? Yeah, no, he is. He is. I just said, uh, not here, not now. <laughs> the meeting is adjourned. Hey.